Good morning, and welcome to the 2008 C.L. Davis Gross Course. I'm Peg Miller, and I will be presenting diseases of the horse at the macroscopic level. And the first thing I'd like to do is thank my colleagues and the universities where I've worked. That's Washington State University, Louisiana State University, University of Missouri, and currently Purdue University. And uh, also like to thank my father, who's the tall guy in the picture here, and the one that probably taught me more about horses than anyone else. There was a time when he had more horses than cattle, and he counted his cattle in the hundreds. But I think by the time this picture was taken, he had more kids than horses. So with that, we'll get started. And we're going to look at diseases of the horse in three segments. The first segment will be an overview of the process of making a morphologic diagnosis. And the goals with this first presentation will be to find the lesion in the picture, to understand what a morphologic diagnosis is and what it has to include, and to make the morphologic diagnosis in three ways. And those three ways, one is just basically a knee-jerk reaction. You recognize the lesion and name it. Sometimes we recognize the disease before we recognize the lesion and backtrack and surmise what the disease may be or what the lesion may be and name it that way. And then we all, and especially when we're starting out, but still when we've had 30 years of experience, we find many lesions that we do not recognize. And those are the ones I'd like to focus on some today with, with the idea that you can still make a morphologic diagnosis if you can categorize that lesion by the process that's, that is occurring there. So step one is simply to recognize the gross lesion, and this is going to be based on your knowledge of anatomy and normal anatomic variations. Description comes into play here, so we will note the color, texture, size, shape, location, and distribution of the lesions. We will definitely consider signalment, although this, is, this lecture is diseases of the horse, so we'll be focusing on equids, but um, that, that points out that what, what we really need to concentrate on here is to make a morphologic diagnosis for diseases of the horse, we need to know what are the important diseases in the species of interest. And I've enlisted the help of my trusty donkey, Margarita, to remind me to tell you when we're looking at something other than a horse. And we will look at a few ponies, um, look at uh, a few donkeys and a few mules. And sometimes it's essential that you know that, other times it's, it's maybe not even important that you know that the animal is an equid. And, but we'll try to point out when it is important. So first, what is a morphologic diagnosis? It is simply the name of a lesion. And that naming is based on structural features that you can see, maybe with the naked eye or maybe with the help of a microscope. And the morphologic diagnosis may or may not be the same as the disease name. In the example shown here, there, the arrow is pointing to a focus of encephalomalacia in the substantia nigra of this brain of a horse. So the morphologic diagnosis if all you have to look at is this picture, is focal encephalomalacia substantia nigra. Many of you who have seen this disease before will know that if I had cut the, the same brain and shown you a picture at a more rostral level, that you would have also seen focal encephalomalacia in the globus pallidus, and you would have already recognized this disease as nigropallidal encephalomalacia. That is a disease name telling us that, that it is caused by consumption of yellow star thistle, a plant that grows in the, in the northwest. And in this case, the disease name is a morphologic diagnosis. But if you're only dealing with this one cross-section of the brain, you could not diagnose nigropallidal encephalomalacia because you cannot see the globus pallidus. So you'd have to stick with just focal encephalomalacia substantia nigra. But it is an example where the morphology diagnosis and the name of the disease can be the same. So to reiterate this process of naming the lesion or making a morphologic diagnosis, 
can be done simply by recognizing the lesion and doing that knee-jerk response, naming it. Sometimes we recognize the disease first and then know what the lesion will be or we can surmise that lesion and name it in that way. And especially today we want to practice making a morphologic diagnosis for lesions that we don't recognize by categorizing them according to the disease process that, that we see. A morphologic diagnosis has two essential components and one is an identification of the organ or tissue that's affected and the other is categorization of the disease process. It's either degeneration or necrosis, it's inflammation or the repair thereof, it's circulatory disturbances or it's disturbances of growth. Those are the four categories that we will try to pigeonhole every lesion into. A morphologic diagnosis must identify both the affected organ or tissue and the process of disease. So here are some examples of morphologic diagnoses that are complete. For instance, hepatic necrosis identifies the process as necrosis and identifies the tissue as liver. Pneumonia is a one-word complete morphologic diagnosis that tells us that the process is inflammation and the tissue affected is the lung. Hemopericardium, another one-word and complete morphologic diagnosis that tells us that the process is a circulatory disturbance, hemorrhage in this case, and the tissue affected is the pericardial sac. Thyroid hyperplasia is a complete morphologic diagnosis that tells us the process is a disturbance of growth and the tissue affected is the thyroid gland. So those are four examples of complete morphologic diagnoses. Sometimes they're sufficient, sometimes they would be much improved if we added an adjective or two, don't get carried away with those, but if we add an adjective or two, we can indicate the distribution of the lesion, we can tell what type of inflammation is going on, we can imply that there is one, more than one process of disease. For example, um, back to our hepatic necrosis, that doesn't tell the reader of your morphologic diagnosis much, but if you add just one adjective, if you say multifocal hepatic necrosis, it gives that reader a very different impression than if you say central lobular hepatic necrosis. So if we say multifocal, we are telling the reader that we suspect an infectious cause, an infectious disease. If, on the other hand, there is some pattern to the hepatic necrosis, for example, central lobular hepatic necrosis, we immediately shift our, our list of causes to metabolic or toxic diseases. Um, with our example of pneumonia being uh, categorization as inflammation, that may tell someone we're probably thinking of an infectious cause, but it gives us a very long differential list. We can narrow that differential diagnosis considerably by adding one modifier to say what kind of inflammation it is, what kind of cells do we think are there. For instance, if we say granulomatous pneumonia, it, it will immediately shift the, the reader, the listener, to think of fungal causes or perhaps higher bacterial causes rather than viral causes. So it narrows the list of potential causes. And you'll very often find that it's difficult or impossible to pigeonhole a lesion into just one disease process. You can use a modifier like necrotizing with hepatitis to tell, to imply that both necrosis and inflammation are occurring in the liver. Similarly, you could use the term hyperplastic gastritis, add one modifier, hyperplastic, to say that in addition to inflammation in the stomach, there is a disturbance of growth, hyperplasia, increase in cell numbers. So remember that if, if you recognize the lesion, shout out your morphologic diagnosis. If you do not recognize the lesion or the disease, try to categorize it as degeneration or necrosis, inflammation or its repair, circulatory disturbances or growth disturbances. And we will now look at those diseases in this order, starting with degeneration or necrosis. Sometimes we use the term, the suffix osis, 
to imply degeneration, as in nephrosis or endocardiosis, but more commonly and probably better, we, use the, we simply use the word degeneration to, a, as part of the diagnosis. We will switch from degeneration to necrosis when we know that the degenerative process is irreversible, that the tissue has progressed beyond the point of no return and is actually dead. The gross changes that we might expect to find that will tip us off that we are dealing with degeneration or necrosis is pallor in the tissue, and this is caused because cells as they degenerate tend to swell, they tend to accumulate things that have no color, such as water, hydropic change, and that, that cell swelling with accumulation of water gives tissues, especially liver, kidney, and muscle, a paler hue. We sometimes can recognize necrosis at the gross level when there's an obvious loss of structure, and especially when the tissue is very well demarcated from surrounding viable tissue. So now we will get into looking at a few pictures and examples of degenerative changes. And we'll, we will look at hydropic change, fatty change, amyloidosis, mineralization, and pigment deposition as examples of gross degenerative changes. And the first picture we note that the cortex of this kidney, which should be liver brown, is more of a tan or khaki color. And that and it's a diffuse change that should suggest to us a degenerative process. We know that the renal tubules are especially susceptible to, to degeneration, so we can surmise that this is renal tubular degeneration. And that would be the best morphologic diagnosis for this case. So we're reflecting hydropic change. We're calling it renal tubular degeneration. We could also call it tubular nephrosis but it's more specific and more precise to actually use the word degeneration. Fatty change is most commonly recognized in the liver and the kidney. It imparts a yellow color and perhaps a greasy texture to the affected tissues. Tissues may be so severely affected that sections of the affected organs may actually float in formalin. And the example here is a cross-section of liver showing fatty change. So the morphologic diagnosis you would make would be hepatic lipidosis. And this is one of those examples where it's very helpful to know that this is a pony. And you may have even guessed that this is a pony because hepatic lipidosis is not something we commonly see in horses, but ponies are predisposed. So the morphologic diagnosis, hepatic lipidosis, would be the best. You could also call it fatty change. You would have to then remember to say liver. And this was a pony with the syndrome of equine hyperlipemia, which is, it's called equine hyperlipemia, but it might be better called pony hyperlipemia. Amyloidosis in horses is most commonly seen in the liver, the skin, and in the nasal mucosa. And the example here is, is hepatic amyloidosis. So we're looking at the liver. Tissues that are affected by amyloid tend to swell because it's a deposition of something. So the tissues will usually expand. They may take on a characteristic and somewhat odd brown color. Uh, of course, the liver is brown already, but the liver is usually red-brown in the shade of amyloid. Um, you can see here in the, where the liver has been sectioned is a little bit different shade than we might expect a normal horse's liver to be. More importantly for the horse and, and perhaps for the diagnostician, the deposition of amyloid changes the texture of the liver such that it is much more prone to fracture with minimal trauma and to rupture of the hepatic capsule. And that's what's happened to this horse. You can appreciate in the picture that that the liver is swollen with rounded edges. You can see the strange brown color here, but what you're seeing here is a fracture of the liver, rupture of the hepatic capsule, and formation of a rather massive hematoma in this liver. So amyloidosis is something you should think about. The tip off here is actually the hematoma in the liver, and this wasn't a horse that was hit by a truck. This was a horse that 
that did not receive any any noticeable trauma and yet died with with the hemorrhage from a fractured liver and amyloidosis was the underlying cause of that so morphologic diagnosis hepatic amyloidosis with subcapsular hematoma and it was the hematoma that is the fatal or ultimate fatal component here Calcification usually gets classified as a degenerative change. We recognize it grossly because it, is, it, is, it appears as white chalky deposits, and we are seeing it in this horse on the endocardium around the mitral valve. And you, you notice several things. The mitral valve, especially the atrial part of it, looks corrugated like cardboard, and we can actually see those tan to white chalky plaques on the endocardial surface. This can result from hypercalcemia, which was thought to be the case in this particular horse, or it may be a sequel to necrosis, and in that case we call it dystrophic calcification. And the morphologic diagnosis in this case is endocardial calcification. The cause for this horse was consumption of the toxic plant Cestrum diurnum. It contain, its toxic component is a vitamin D analog, and so it causes hypercalcemia and metastatic calcification. Pigmentation is another thing that usually is classified or categorized as degeneration. And there are a few pigments that are exogenous, such as anthracosis or pneumoconiosis. Most of the pigments, the abnormal accumulation of pigments that we see in tissues grossly are endogenous pigments, and I've listed several examples here. If you look at this picture, which is a kidney of a foal, and it, it's very helpful to know in this case, we're back to the signal again, it's helpful to know that it is a foal and not an adult horse. And in this picture, we can detect accumulation of two pigments. One's maybe more obvious, and that is the discoloration of tissues that should be white or close to white, and that discoloration is a yellow discoloration. So if you... If you concentrate on the renal pelvis here, or the renal medulla, tissues which should be quite pale and close to white. They are instead yellow to orange, and that yellowish discoloration, we would make a morphologic diagnosis of icterus. But remember I said there was another pigment showing here, and that pigment is hemoglobin. trouble getting my pointer to work. There we go. So th you'll notice that the cortex is diffusely discolored. It should be liver brown. We're in a kidney, but, but a horse kidney should be the same color as a horse liver. And instead of liver brown, it's a color that often gets the name of gunmetal. It's a very characteristic name, I think, very good name. And that tells us that the pigment deposition is hemoglobin. Myoglobin can look quite similar, but one way that you can tell that this is hemoglobinuric nephrosis rather than myoglobinuric nephrosis is the fact that it is accompanied by icterus. And we expect hemoglobinuric nephrosis to be accompanied by icterus. We would not expect myoglobinuric nephrosis to be accompanied by icterus. Okay, we will switch gears just a little bit. We're still in the category of degeneration and necrosis but now we're shifting from degeneration to necrosis and remember we use that term when we are confident that there's irreversible degeneration or cell death. When we're not confident of that we can we can just uh, default back to degeneration. It wouldn't really be wrong but if we are confident that the tissue is truly dead then necrosis is the better term. And remember that we can recognize it grossly when there's a loss of structure and when it's well demarcated from the surrounding viable tissue. We're looking at a close-up of a foal's liver, and the lesion that we are seeing are multifocal, are random spots of tissue that looks crumbly. It has a, a loss of structure, and it's much paler than the surrounding liver brown tissue. So instead of brown, it's yellow or tan. 
very small foci. That, but that gives us enough information, because it's well demarcated from the adjacent normal tissue, to say that this is hepatic necrosis. And remember that it's very important to indicate the, dif the distribution of necrosis in the liver. This is a random pattern. We call that multifocal. It is not a lobular pattern. Very important then to modify that diagnosis and make a morphologic diagnosis of multifocal hepatic necrosis. Now, many of you will have recognized this as Tizer's disease in a foal because I told you it was a foal. And a foal between one and six weeks of age would be even more helpful. And if you recognized it as Tizer's disease, you will know that in addition to necrosis, there is also inflammation happening in this liver. And an even better diagnosis or a more precise diagnosis would be multifocal necrotizing hepatitis to reflect the fact that you recognize that there is both inflammation and necrosis going on in, in the liver of this foal with Tizer's disease. Still in the category of necrosis, we use the term malacia in pathology mostly for two organ systems. And one is the skeletal system. And we use it in the skeletal system. Um, to, well, actually, it means softening, whether we're talking about the skeletal system or another system. But we use it in the skeletal system to imply softening of bone because there is a failure of ossification, a failure of mineralization of the bone. When we use it in the brain or in the central nervous system, which is the other system where we frequently use the term malacia, we again mean softening, but we very specifically mean that the affected tissue, that the soft tissue is soft because it's dead. So we're talking about necrosis. Malacia is a gross diagnosis for necrosis in, when, when we're in the central nervous system. So the morphologic diagnosis for this cross-section of the cerebrum would be encephalomalacia. It, that tells us that it's softening and necrosis in the brain. It might be a little bit better to say it's cerebral encephalomalacia. In this case, it's both polio and leuco, so you wouldn't need to specify that. And the cause in this case was an accidental intracarotid or intraarterial injection of phenylbutazone. Ulceration is another example of necrosis. It implies that there is necrosis and loss of epithelium. So we use it for epithelial surfaces and see ulcers mainly in the skin, the digestive tract, um, respiratory tract, and reproductive tracts. We are looking at a picture of a horse's stomach right at the Margo plicatus, so you can see both non-glandular mucosa, the white part towards the top of the picture, and the pinker glandular mucosa below, and we have multiple ulcers, mostly quite close to the margo plicatus. And the morphologic diagnosis is ulcers or gastric ulcers, um, but it's telling us that necrosis had to happen. Those, those epithelial cells are dead, and that's why we have an ulcer. Else is the end result. Infarction is an example of necrosis that is caused by interruption of the blood supply. It's especially common in end artery tissues. For example, the kidney is shown here. And this was an infarct that was secondary to Strongylus vulgaris larval migration. And uh, actually something that we see fairly commonly in Strongylus vulgaris infection in horses, renal infarcts are, and not too surprising when you remember how close the renal arteries are to the cranial mesenteric artery, which is the preferred site of these larvae for maturation. So the infarct is shown here. It's red and swollen, which tells us that it's acute, and uh, we're talking about one, two days possibly. And the morphologic diagnosis for a renal infarct is renal infarct. It's nice to add the term hemorrhagic to distinguish it from a resolving infarct. And in this case, as I mentioned, it was secondary to larval migration of Strongylus vulgaris. Fat necrosis is a, a special kind of necrosis that occurs in adipose tissue. It's accompanied by saponification or soap formation. It's usually also accompanied by inflammation that tends to be granulomatous. 
Grossly, we will recognize it because in distinction to normal fat, necrotic fat is firmer, more lobular, more opaque, and it will have those chalky soap deposits in the tissue. This is abdominal wall of a horse, and so we are seeing this lobular change, opacity, the tissue's firmer than normal, and we can see these paler zones of soap formation to tell us that there's fat necrosis and saponification in this horse. So morphologic diagnosis is necrosis and saponification of adipose tissue. Gangrene is another special kind of necrosis which is mostly used for extremities, especially the extremities of the limbs, and it implies that the tissue is dead from one point, one point distally. It should be well demarcated from viable tissue. If it's a sterile process, the dead tissue will be dry and leathery. If it's an infectious process, that dead tissue tends to be dark, wet, and malodorous. So it's gangrene in, a, in the distal aspect of the limb of a horse. Okay, switching to a new category, we will now talk about making morphologic diagnosis in the case of inflammation. We can recognize inflammation when we see exudate, and we will try to look at an, at an example of each of these types of exudate or of inflammation. So we will start with a very mild and very acute form of inflammation. Serous inflammation implies that the exudate, which is really more of a transudate, is mainly water. And we see this mainly in the conjunctiva and in nasal mucosa. And so it is a watery discharge and the affected mucosa is usually pink or red, redder than it should be. And the picture is showing serous conjunctivitis in a horse that had anterior uveitis. So anterior uveitis was its disease or its important lesion, but we can't see that with this picture. What we are seeing is just a wetting of the, of the conjunctiva, pinkening of the conjunctiva, and wetting of the hairs around the eyelid. Fibrinous inflammation is a very common thing to find in, at necropsy. It's easiest to see on surfaces, mucosal or serosal surfaces, and it appears, if it's uncomplicated, if it's just fibrin or mainly fibrin, it appears as a gray or tan, shaggy exudate. It's very commonly accompanied by other blood components, and if there are many neutrophils in the exudate, in addition to the fibrin, that the exudate will take on a yellow color, as shown here, and then we will combine um, both terms, the fibrino to mean that, that, it's that it's fibrinous inflammation, but purulent to indicate that there are a lot of neutrophils in it. So the abdomen here is a case of fibrinopurulent peritonitis in a foal, and Salmonella typhimurium was the cause in this case. If fibrinous exudate is accompanied by a lot of red blood cells, indicating greater damage to the vessels, then we could combine the prefix fibrino with the suffix hemorrhagic. And the example shown here is the opened urinary bladder of a mare, and the morphologic diagnosis is fibrinohemorrhagic cystitis. So most of the exudate looks quite red here. Hemorrhagic inflammation can be very difficult to tell from to from simple non-inflammatory hemorrhage. It can affect any tissue, and it implies severe damage to the vessels so that there is major hemorrhage and not just leakage of white blood cells and fibrin. And hemorrhagic inflammation is shown in, is shown in the intestine here. The morphologic diagnosis would be hemorrhagic enteritis. Catarrhal inflammation, we use the term catarrhal to imply that the inflammation is characterized by abundant mucus. So it happens in tissues that are lined by mucosa, respiratory tract, digestive tract, and the reproductive tract mainly. And we often use the term muco uh, 
to combine that with other descriptors. For instance, in this case, we are looking at the tracheal bifurcation and the lungs of a horse that had pulmonary granular cell tumor, but the lesion we're trying to depict here is the accumulation of yellow mucoid exudate. If it's that yellow, we should assume that there are a lot of neutrophils there, and so we can combine that and say mucopurulent bronchitis or tracheobronchitis might be even better. Um, the culprit in this case is the granular cell tumor and portions of that tumor are shown here partially obstructing that bronchus and that's the reason for the excessive accumulation of mucopurulent exudate. We use the terms purulent or separative to imply that the exudate contains numerous neutrophils. It usually will be some shade of yellow. And again, as we've pointed out with previous examples, we may combine the term separative or purulent with prefixes like muco or fibrino to indicate other components of the exudate. This is a foal that had strangles, streptococcus equi, equi infection and the, this is a postmortem lancing of an abscessed lymph node. So the best morphologic diagnosis for this would be purulent lymphadenitis. Other terms that imply purulent inflammation include cellulitis. We use that for purulent or separative inflammation of connective tissue. It's shown at the to top in a dehiscent wound of a horse. Pustule is a term that means a small, discrete aggregate of pus. Abscesses, as shown in the bottom picture, are larger accumulations of pus and they are encapsulated by fibrous connective tissue. So we're looking at abscesses in the lung of a horse that had strep equi infection. Empyema is a term that we use to mean purulent inflammation that fills cavities. For example, guttural pouch empyema. We also very often will use the prefix pio, meaning pus, followed by identification of the cavity that's filled as in pyothorax or pyometra. Granulomatous inflammation, the term granulomatous implies that the exudate contains a lot of epithelioid macrophages with varying degree of organization into discrete granulomas. If there's a lot of organization, you may appreciate a nodular appearance to the affected tissue, and those nodules may be anywhere from microscopic, something we only see with the microscope, or they may be a few millimeters in diameter, as shown in this case of granulomatous pneumonia, or they may be fist-sized. So they can vary a lot in their size. And as I mentioned, we're looking at a cross-section of lung with one or two millimeter nodules of uh, yellow to tan granulomatous inflammation. And granulomatous pneumonia is the best morphologic diagnosis. The cause in this case, or the etiologic diagnosis in this case, was pulmonary aspergillosis. The repair of inflammation or necrosis is usually done by two processes, and the earlier process is granulation tissue. That's a proliferation of both fibroblasts and endothelial cells with neovascularization. It's especially common beneath ulcers. So we're looking at an example of granulation tissue over the knee in a horse, and the horse is especially good at making granulation tissue to the extent that it simulates a tumor. And the tumor that it would simulate in, in this example would be sarcoid, which could also look quite like this and is covered by granulation tissue. So grossly it appears as red granular tissue that bleeds easily and it, it can be quite exuberant in the horse. We use the term proud flesh sometimes when it takes on this tumor-like appearance and can be very difficult to cure by surgical excision because it grows back. The later stage of repair is fibrosis or scar formation. So at this point, there's less vascularity to the, to the fibrous tissue, less cellularity, so the fibroblasts become quiescent and, and fewer in number, but fibrosis is more or less a permanent lesion and, and the end stage result is a scar. 
The example we're showing at the bottom picture is a horse with chronic laminitis and there is a thick band of white fibrous connective tissue between the hoof wall and the third phalanx. Switching categories again, leaving inflammation, we're moving into circulatory disturbances. We will look at hyperemia, at congestion, edema, dehydration, hemorrhage, ischemia, and thrombosis. Hyperemia and congestion um, we'll look at together. Hyperemia is an active process, so we almost never diagnose it at necropsy when there's no activity anymore. We diagnose congestion very commonly and uh, so commonly that, it's, that it doesn't provide a lot of, of diagnostic assistance. But congestion, as you might expect, will redden and darken the tissue. In the lung, it's often accompanied by edema. It also tends to expand tissues. So you'll notice that in this example of pulmonary congestion in a horse, that in addition to being to most of the lung, this part of the lung specifically being darker than it should be, there's somewhat more normally colored lung in the cranial lobe. So the lung is not only darker, but you can also appreciate that it's expanded. And the way you can tell that is not only does it fill the thoracic cavity, but you can also see the rib imprints um, where, where the ribs have compressed the lung and the paler tissue in between the rib imprints. So the lung was actually compressed or, or smashed against the ribs, and that's why we get that appearance. Edema is a little less common, so more helpful diagnostically. It appears in many forms. It can fill body cavities, so simply cavities full of water. Examples, hydrothorax, hydropericardium, ascites, or it can expand tissues where we're talking about interstitial edema. And tissues that are affected by edema, if it's not joined by congestion will tend to be paler than normal because we're accumulating water which has no color. Obviously they tend to be wetter than normal if we're accumulating water and again they tend to expand. In the top example we have many forms of edema in one picture. We can see the hydropericardium with the amber transparent fluid accumulating in the pericardial sac. We can appreciate that the pericardial sac itself is affected by interstitial edema because we can't see through it. So it, had a, it has an opaque appearance shown here. So part of the pericardial sac has been opened so you can see the hydropericardium. But if you look at the pericardial sac itself, you see that it's thickened and it's opaque. And we also can appreciate pulmonary edema here in several ways. We can actually see tortuous dilated lymphatics on the surface of the lung the interlobular septa are wider than they should be because they are widened by edema fluid. And again, as in the last example with pulmonary congestion, the lung is expanded and we can see rib imprints on the surface of the lung and the lung fills the thoracic cavity. If we look at the bottom picture, we are seeing an example of edema of the placenta from a mare that had fescue toxicosis. And in this case, the, the placenta is much thicker than normal. It weighs more than normal. As a matter of fact, we can use the weight of the placenta to help us diagnose fescue toxicosis as a cause for perinatal death. And it is more opaque than it should be so that we cannot see through the placental membranes as we might expect to. Hemorrhage. Another circulatory disturbance can be classified by size. So you know that uh, the tiniest hemorrhages, the ones that we, they're, they're pinpoint, we can barely see them, we call petechiae. If they're a little bit larger, a few millimeters, maybe a centimeter in diameter, we'll call those ecchymoses. And the picture of the horse's lung here, this was a, was a horse with endotoxemia, shows examples of both petechia and ecchymotic hemorrhage. If hemorrhage becomes more extensive, we can use the term suffusive, and that's shown around the joint of this foal that, that was traumatized and suffers uh, suffusive periarticular hemorrhage and edema around that traumatized joint. Hemorrhage may also fill body cavities. So examples would be hemothorax, hemoperitoneum, or it may form a mass. In the example on the left, we are looking at hemopericardium 
and the hemorrhage is filling the pericardial sac, which has not been opened, but you can see the black discoloration that tells us that there is very unoxygenated blood filling that pericardial sac. You can also see the hemorrhage dissecting along the thoracic aorta here, a more suffusive hemorrhage. And the example in this spleen picture on the right are, are several hematomas that have formed in the, in the spleen of this horse. And the largest one is shown here. This one is actually ruptured. So when, when hemorrhage forms a mass that looks like a tumor, we call that a hematoma. So splenic hematoma would be the morphologic diagnosis for that case. Thrombosis means that we have intravascular coagulation. This may happen in vessels or it may happen inside the heart. We can tell it from a postmortem clot because it tends to be paler, it has a roughened surface, and especially on cross-section, it should have a variegated appearance. It may or may not result in infarction, depending on the tissue. We're looking at an example in lung of pulmonary arterial thrombosis, and remember that the lung has a dual blood supply, so the lung may often develop rather severe and extensive pulmonary arterial thrombosis, but because of, of the bronchial arteries, there may be no infarction. Switching categories to our last classification, we will talk about disturbances of growth and look at examples of anomalies, hypoplasia, atrophy, so a couple of things that make tissues too small or organs too small and several things that make organs too big, hyperplasia, hypertrophy, and neoplasia. And the anomaly in that foal we'll actually look at again, but you can tell by his domed head that he probably suffers from hydrocephalus. So anomalies, if we use the term anomaly, which we would not use as a morphologic diagnosis, but when we are categorizing something as an anomaly, we mean that there was abnormal fetal development. We are talking about lesions that are present at birth. And the example shown here is the mouth of a horse, and the lesion is, the name of the lesion is cleft palate. That's a good morphologic diagnosis. You could also use the term palatoschesis, but uh, either one would be correct. Hypoplasia means that there is a failure of an organ or tissue to develop to ever reach its normal size and formation. And the end result is miniaturization. And it is important to distinguish it from atrophies in some tissues that can be difficult to do. The example I've picked for hypoplasia in this foal is the tissue that's hypoplastic are the optic nerves. They are both affected, so the best morphologic diagnosis would be bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia. The hemorrhage uh, shown in this picture is, is artifactual because the ophthalmologists, and ophthalmologists like to do this, by the way, remove the eyes before the necropsy. So they caused, caused immediately after the death of the animal, but uh, early enough that they could still cause some hemorrhage at that point. So what we're trying to show is that the optic nerves are about one quarter the size that they should be. Atrophy means that the organ or tissue is too small, but it implies that it was at one time well formed and the smallness is the result of shrinkage. It's commonly observed in all species in lymphoid tissue, especially the thymus, in adipose tissue as part of emaciation cachexia, and in skeletal muscle, from, especially from either disuse or denervation. And the example we're showing in, with this horse is skeletal muscle is what's affected. The morphologic diagnosis would be muscular atrophy, and the disease that this horse had was equine motor neuron disease. Hyperplasia implies that the tissue or the organ is larger than it should be, and it implies that that increase in size is due to increased numbers of cells. So it's especially, in co it's especially common in tissues that are capable of cell division, or especially capable of cell division, such as any gland, skin, lymphoid tissue, um, enteric tract is, a, is another possibility. And the example we're showing here 
um, hesitate to even call this a lesion, but this is an example of lymphoid hyperplasia in the oropharynx. And uh, it's a horse, and I probably don't even need to tell you that it's an approximately a yearling horse. This is a, is a very common and arguably normal finding in horses when they are dealing with vaccines and dealing with their first exposures to a variety of infectious agents. Their lymphoid tissue should respond in this way, and it does rather, um, rather faithfully. And this is a finding that we expect in any animal of this age, around a year of age. So the diagnosis would be lymphoid hyperplasia. Hypertrophy means that the organ or tissue increases in size because the cells increase in size rather than that the cells are increasing in number. And it's most obvious in tissues that are incapable of cell division, such as the myocardium to, to a great extent, such as skeletal muscle. And the example we're showing here is muscular hypertrophy in the distal esophagus of a horse. Um, the stomach is here. You can see a little bit of stomach content and the non-glandular mucosa everted here. But w the tissue of interest is the esophagus, and it's been cut here, and you can see the cross-section here. Very thickened muscular wall, very narrowed lumen. This is an idiopathic disease in horses. We don't quite know why it happens, but the morphologic diagnosis would be esophageal to identify the tissue and muscular hypertrophy to identify the process. Neoplasia, last category of disturbances of growth. The morphologic diagnosis for a tumor, for a neoplastic process, is simply the name of the tumor. And of course, there's instances when you cannot do that at the macroscopic level, when you cannot guess what the tumor is. But if you can, then, then you simply name the tumor. And in the example we're showing here, you see that there are many tumors and that these tumors are distributed over serosal surfaces in the abdominal cavity and in the pleural cavity. And the tumor that would be most likely to do that, to have that appearance, would be mesothelioma. Don't forget that, that if you're naming a tumor, that, and the name of the tumor does not tell you what tissue or organ is involved, that you need to include that in a morphologic diagnosis to make it complete. So in this case, we might say pleural and peritoneal mesothelioma. So in summary, the morphologic diagnosis, the process of making a morphologic diagnosis is simply naming a lesion. You only have to detect the lesion, to find the lesion, then you call it by its name if you recognize it, and if you don't recognize it, you try to categorize it by the disease process. And in the subsequent couple of lectures, we will try to practice the morphologic diagnosis from a systemic approach by the body system. Of Welcome back to Diseases of the Horse. We, in these last two sessions, we are going to look at diseases of the horse with the diseases arranged by the body system that's affected. And we will start with the musculoskeletal system and proceed through the, through the remaining systems. In this first slide, remembering that, we, that it's identified for you as musculoskeletal system, what you're seeing is the thoracic and abdominal cavity of a horse and specifically, and you're searching frantically, I'm sure, for something that has to do with the musculoskeletal system, and here it is, is it, we're in the muscular system actually. This is the diaphragm of this horse in its normal position, but herniated through this diaphragm is a good portion of the spleen, a good portion of the large colon, and they're not herniated, but there's also abundant hemorrhage in the thoracic cavity, so we could make a morphologic diagnosis of hemothorax as well. But the, the pertinent or, or the important morphologic diagnosis in this case is diaphragmatic hernia. And the cause would be trauma or anything that would cause a sudden increase in abdominal pressure. Second slide in the musculoskeletal system, we are looking at a cross-section of epaxial skeletal musculature, and the abnormality is, in, is that instead of all the muscle 
looking muscle colored, in other words, red brown. We have patchy areas of tan pallor in the muscle. And that, remember the pallor, should clue us into the fact that we are dealing with a degeneration. The process is degeneration. A good morphologic diagnosis for this case would be rhabdomyolysis. It's also the name of the disease or the name of the condition. Or we could simply use the terms degeneration and necrosis and then identify the tissue as skeletal muscle. In the pathogenesis in this case, there are different approaches that you could take, but one logical approach would be that this began with carbohydrate loading during rest, followed by exertion, leading to lactic acidosis, and uh, in other words, this is the Monday morning disease of horses. If you were asked to name an associated lesion that we often see with rhabdomyolysis or, or necrosis and degeneration of the skeletal muscle, a couple of examples would be myoglobin uric nephrosis, reflecting the necrosis of the skeletal muscle, and polysaccharide storage myopathy is a lesion in the skeletal muscle that is often seen in horses with rhabdomyolysis. Third slide for the musculoskeletal system is a cross section through the supraspinous bursa uh, shown here and the nuchal ligament shown here, subcutis at the top, and the lesion is in the supraspinous bursa. We're seeing granulomatous inflammation with uh, chalky white deposits of calcium. A good morphologic diagnosis would be granulomatous supraspinous bursitis. Causes to consider, we actually think that trauma may be the, the initiating event in most of these cases, but infectious agents that could also be here, one would be the nematode, Oncocercus cervicalis. That's where the adults live and they may contribute to some of these lesions. If we had a more separative appearance to the lesion or fistulation, and if we were in the withers in particular, we might also think of brucella abortus. Musculoskeletal system, we're now moving into the skeletal part of the system, and in this fourth picture, we are looking at a sagittal section of the head of a horse. It's a young horse. It's a horse that's just entered into training. And we might have guessed from the picture that it is a young horse because what the lesion is is a fracture and it has formed at, at the site of sutures in the basilar skull of the, in the basilar bones of the skull. And the morphologic diagnosis in this case would be basisphenoid fracture. And we know that this is a lesion that does occur in young horses, usually at about the time they go into training. They're poorly trained at this point, not well halt or broken. They rear up, they fall over backwards, they hit the top of their head. But where their fractures are more likely to occur is in the basilar bones of the skull. So basisphenoid fracture. Slide five is a cross-section through the muzzle. Again, this is a young horse, about a yearling, and uh, or I think actually it was a weanling foal, so a little bit younger than a year. And the very obvious lesion is that there is a huge mass centered on one side of the mandible of this weanling foal. And the morphologic diagnosis in this case, we are dealing with a neoplastic process, or at least a tumor-like lesion, so we simply name the tumor. We're in rostral mandible. We can tell that by the, by the size of the nasal cavity. We can see the tongue. We can see the teeth. So the best morphologic diagnosis is the name of the tumor, and the name of the tumor is mandibular ossifying fibroma. If you were asked to describe the histologic features. That could be summarized as a fibroblastic, a bland fibroblastic proliferation with formation of irregular bony trabeculae that are lined or bordered by osteoblasts. So mandibular ossifying fibroma in a weanling foal. Musculoskeletal system slide six is a sagittal section of the cervical spine of a young horse. Again, this was an Arabian horse and also a foal. 
and sometimes lesions can be hard to find and so you're frantically looking for the lesion and in this case where you want to focus in this almost perfect sagittal or slightly off-center sagittal section is notice that the opening for the spinal canal or the opening for the spinal cord should follow a very straight line and if it doesn't that's bad news for the horse and in this case we do follow a straight line right up to the junction between the first and second cervical vertebrae and then we see that the first first cervical vertebrae is dorsally placed or dorsally luxated in comparison to the second so your morphologic diagnosis in this case would be atlantoaxial subluxation. Musculoskeletal system slide seven. Again, we are looking at uh, cervical spine. This time we're zoomed in on an articular facet of a cervical vertebrae. And instead of looking smooth, opalescent, uh, shiny surfaced and, and a very perfect or quite regular oval appearance. We have a scalloped perimeter. We have uh, numerous fissures and defects in the articular cartilage, a generalized roughening of that articular surface. And that means that those vertebrae won't be articulating very well. And the morphologic diagnosis in this case is also the name of the condition, osteochondrosis, and be sure to identify as closely as you can what tissue you're looking at, so osteochondrosis of a vertebral articular facet. The condition could be called, has several names, could be called equine cervical instability, could also be called wobbler syndrome. It's a common name. Musculoskeletal system slide eight is the open tarsal joint of a yearling horse. And the picture shows a subchondral cystic lesion here. You can see the cystic cavity there and extensive loss of the articular surface at this side of the joint and this side sort of serving as our normal control. That's, so that's the main lesion. It has the same morphologic diagnosis as, as the one that we just looked at, osteochondrosis. Slide nine, still in the musculoskeletal system, is another foal. This time we're looking at a longitudinal section through the fetlock. And what we see is an area of lysis and separative inflammation that is centered around the physis or the growth plate. And the morphologic diagnosis in this case is separative and or necrotizing osteomyelitis. And the cause in this case was Salmonella typhimurium. There are other causes that it could be, but that's certainly one to consider and was the actual cause in this particular case of osteomyelitis in a foal. This is a different foal with all four fetlock joints opened and we're looking, the, the hooves are sitting on the floor and we're looking down from above. All four joints have the same lesion and again we have a, uh, extensive loss of articular cartilage but we also have abundant separative or purulent exudate. We have involvement of the joint capsule, the synovial membrane, the articular surfaces. So the best morphologic diagnosis for this lesion would be arthritis because it's not just the synovial membrane but it's also the, the articular surfaces and even into the, into the bone of those joints. We should call it separative or purulent because of the type of exudate we're seeing and we also should use the modifier poly to indicate that many joints are involved in this case. So all four limbs are similarly affected. So morphologic diagnosis is, sep is purulent polyarthritis and the cause in this foal was also Salmonella typhimurium. Switching systems now to the nervous system, the first slide shows the head of this foal, and this was a Belgian foal that was delivered by cesarean section. 
foal was actually late in gestation. It had exceeded its normal um, gestation period. This is the, the head of the foal that shows the, the domed appearance to the skull and is giving us a very strong clue as to what morphologic diagnosis we will encounter. And this is the opened skull of this foal. And when the skull was opened, the brain was like a big balloon, but when the skull was opened, the, the water, in this case of hydrocephalus, escaped and the, the brain collapsed onto the floor of the, of the cranial vault. So morphologic diagnosis in this case is simply hydrocephalus. And it implies that something has obstructed the outflow of the ventricular system in the brain, allowing accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid. Nervous system slide two, the picture on the left, quick microphone adjustment here. The picture on the left shows the face of a foal. This foal was about a week old. And the lesion that we are depicting in this picture is the appearance of a hernial sac on the forehead of this foal, almost right between the eyes. And the foal was diagnosed with a meningoencephalocele by the clinicians and euthanized. At necropsy, the head has been, sac has been sagittally sectioned just off center of that hernial sac. So the hernial sac is about here. And if we look at the cranial vault in this case, we see a fairly normal brain stem um, right up into the midbrain. We see a, a rather normal in size and shape cerebellum. What we don't see is very much cerebrum at all. And what little we do see is pushing up and actually herniated into that hernial sac. So in this case, whereas from the clinical appearance, we might have included the possibility that it was merely a meningocele, that only the meninges were herniated. But now we can see that the brain tissue accompanies the meninges, so the best morphologic diagnosis for this would be meningoencephalocele. Nervous system slide three, we're back with adult horses now. And uh, the morphologic diagnosis for this case is leukoencephalomalacia. So that term, the malacia, remember, is telling us that the brain is soft, but it's also implying that the brain is necrotic. We can add the modifier leuco, very appropriate in this case, to mean that the necrosis of tissue is in the white matter of the brain, not in the gray matter. So the gray matter is spared, the white matter is affected by necrosis. And we see that grossly as a swelling of the white matter, a yellowing of the white matter, so white matter should be white, and here we have yellowing of the white matter. Those are good clues. In some places, it's progressed to liquefactive necrosis, and we have a loss of structure. So that's telling us it's, it's encephalomalacia, and we can see quite a bit of normal gray matter, even in the areas where the white matter is quite discolored. So we know it's sparing the gray matter, and, and the best morphologic diagnosis is leukoencephalomalacia. And the cause of this is the, the ultimate cause is fumonisin B1. And we know that this is moldy corn poisoning in the horse. And the mold that's incriminated is Fusarium maniliforme. Nervous system slide four. This is a sagittal section of the head of a yearling horse. And the several lesions to see, actually. The main lesion here is a cerebral abscess. And this is shown here on sagittal section. And remember, we said that an abscess is a good-sized accumulation of pus. So the pus is easy to see. A lot of it was lost in the bandsaw, but it's still easy to see. There is yellow purulent exudate in this abscess, quite liquid. And importantly, the abscess has a wall. But there is another lesion here. And we see where the tentorium tucks down between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. We see that a portion of the cerebrum has herniated caudally just under the tentorium cerebelli and is compressing the cerebellum. And that may have been almost a worse problem for the horse than the actual formation of the abscess.
So morphologic diagnosis is cerebral abscess. Um, Subtentorial herniation would be a good second morphologic diagnosis. The cause in this case was Streptococcus equi, subspecies equi. Nervous system, slide five, are two pictures of the same brain. And in the picture of the entire brain, the lesion that we're seeing is a cloudiness, a, a film-like nature, a film-like nature to the meninges, to the leptomeninges of the brain, and is shown best dorsally and medially. And the morphologic diagnosis for that is meningitis. And judging by the, the nature of the inflammation here, you probably would go with suppurative meningitis. But there's a second clue here, and we have the privilege of, of looking at the now formal and fixed brain in cross-section. And we're seeing a lesion that I haven't seen very often in a horse. And I've told you before that sometimes it's very important to think of signal, signalment, think of the species, think of the age, et cetera, and know the diseases that are common in that species and in that age or in that gender. But uh, here's a case where this isn't very common in that species and you have to just think as a pathologist in general and think, well, I haven't seen this in a horse, but I've seen a lesion like this in a dog or I've seen a lesion like this in a cat. And I think if you will think in that mode that you will rec recognize these soap bubble type lesions that are shown best um, in the deep structures of the cerebrum here, but also extending up into the cerebellum here as lesions that are very characteristic of cryptococcosis. And that, in fact, is what this horse had. That is a clue. This is an example of where you should recognize the disease, even though it's in an unexpected species, and you can backtrack from your disease recognition of cryptococcosis into a diagnosis of granulomatous encephalitis. Now we know that in the brain a lot of times the inflammation with cryptococcus infection is not very severe but still it's a good idea to, if you've identified it as a systemic fungus to go with granulomatous for your type of inflammation. So morphologic diagnosis in that case would be granulomatous meningoencephalitis and the cause is cryptococcus neoformans. Nervous system, slide six, we're looking at a cross-section of cerebrum. We have several small lesions um, here, here, but the easiest to see lesion is a rather large area. It's very red, so we can assume there's hemorrhage there, and we can assume there's necrosis because we seem to have liquefaction, loss of structure, almost cavitation at that site. And the morphologic diagnosis for this, you could go with something like focal hemorrhagic encephalitis. You could go focal necrotizing encephalitis or necrohemorrhagic encephalitis. But if you can recognize the nature and the distribution of this lesion, I think that embolic encephalitis is a very good diagnosis here. Now, as far as cause, what this one actually was was aspergillus infection. Salmonella would be a very good second guess. It could look exactly like this. A lot of horses with systemic salmonellosis will get embolic lesions in, in the brain and in other tissues. Nervous system seven. Uh, this one is almost a trick question. We're looking obviously at the ventral aspect of the brain of a horse and we've got a tumor. And that tumor is very exactly situated in the cellar region. Um, exactly where the pituitary is also situated and it's a horse and it's a big mass and we all know that that pituitary adenomas are rather common in old horses. We might be tempted to say pituitary adenoma for morphologic diagnosis but if it doesn't look like a pituitary adenoma don't call it a pituitary adenoma they all look the same to some extent and this one very decidedly does not look like a pituitary adenoma. So, so double check your knee-jerk reactions. And in this case, uh, the tumor was a meningioma. Would be a good second guess. We have a tumor that's surface-oriented, as a meningioma should be. Not such a very common tumor in the horse. But uh, remember that there are other cellar tumors other than pituitary adenoma.
So the morphologic diagnosis in this case was the name of the tumor and that tumor was meningioma. You could call it cellar meningioma, but uh, that might not be necessary. Nervous system slide eight, we are looking at two pictures of the same brain. And one is a sagittal section peeking into the lateral ventricle. And we see that the choroid plexus is, is, is expanded by an inflammatory process that consists of yellow coalescing nodules. And remember when we see nodules, we think granulomatous. And this is such a common lesion in the horse that we may almost have a knee-jerk reaction. We do recognize this lesion, and we know that this is sometimes called cholesteatoma. Maybe a better diagnosis would be simply to say cholesterol granulomas, comma, choroid plexus, to be more specific and, and to not imply that it's a, a neoplastic process. So these are cholesterol granulomas in, in the choroid plexus, a very common lesion in older horses, and lateral ventricle is one of the easiest places to see it. But remember that we can see it anywhere where there's choroid plexus. So another place that we readily find them is in the choroid plexus where it peaks out of the fourth ventricle here. So we see part of the choroid plexus looks normal, looks like a red um, membrane but part of it is, just as it was in the lateral ventricle, is expanded by these coalescing yellow nodules of, of cholesterol deposition and granulomatous inflammation. So morphologic diagnosis in that case is cholesterol granuloma. Don't forget to say where you're seeing it, so you would need to say cholesterol granuloma, choroid plexus. Nervous system nine, two cross sections of the cervical spinal cord of the same horse. And in this case, we are seeing, this is formalin fixed tissue, so what would have looked red or brown in fresh tissue now looks gray to us. It's lost most of its color. But I think you can appreciate that there is a nodular effect to the larger lesions. When we see nodules, we think granuloma. And so a very good morphologic diagnosis for this case would be granulomatous myelitis, so inflammation of the spinal cord, nodules indicating that it's granulomatous. You could also, because you're recognizing the darkening and because you know that it's hard to see any lesion in the brain or the spinal cord unless it's hemorrhagic, you could add hemorrhagic. Um, you could add necrotizing because you're starting to get some loss of structure there. You could use those other modifiers, but with the nodular nature of that, you may want to go at, at least include the adjective granulomatous in there, and it will help you get to the cause in this case, which was sarcocystis neurona. So this is protozoal myelitis in a horse. Cervical, cross sections of the cervical spinal cord of a different horse, a slightly different kind of lesion. Now these two lesions can look the same, but, um, and, and can easily be confused, but I tried to pick examples where I think they look a little bit different. And this time, instead of seeing a nodular lesion, we're seeing linear tracts. Uh, a couple of them showing here, possibly one showing here, and again, Remember that it's very hard to see lesions in the spinal cord and the brain unless they're hemorrhagic. So obviously we do have some hemorrhage there. You could include that in your morphologic diagnosis. Um, but you also, because of the linear or tract-like shape of these lesions, and because of the cervical spinal cord location, you may have, have picked up on the idea that, hey, this could be larval migration, and specifically with strongylus vulgaris. And that was the cause in this case. And if you've recognized that, then you might want to be brave and call this an eosinophilic myelitis or hemorrhagic and eosinophilic myelitis. And the eosinophilic then indicating that you've recognized this as a larval migrans lesion. Nervous system slide 11, these are actually two different horses. And, uh, the first picture will, I think, give you a better chance to identify what cavity we're peering into. So in this, uh, in this picture in the upper left corner, you can see the occipital condyles, and that helps you to figure out that we're looking at the bottom of the head of a horse, and, or sort of the back of the head of the horse, and that these big cavities here, just below the occipital condyles, are the guttural pouches of the horse. 
and and you can actually see the lesion. These two two different horses have the same lesion. Here's the lesion, and this this is the lesion that Phil Johnson at the University of Missouri actually. Um, was with me when I was doing this necropsy and he said pathic mnemonic for strangles. So it's telling us the cause this lesion is one of those rare lesions that's close to pathic mnemonic. It's telling us that the cause of this lesion is Streptococcus equi subspecies equi. And the name of this lesion, what the clinicians call it, is chondroid. So it's a guttural pouch chondroid. You could use that as a morphologic diagnosis with the idea that a morphologic diagnosis is simply the naming of a lesion. Or you could sort of backtrack and make a more logical uh, morphologic diagnosis based on what you're seeing and the fact that you know that this is a strangles lesion and go with something like separative or chronic separative in gluvitis. In gluvitis meaning that it's inflammation of the guttural pouch. Nervous system 12, we're looking again at a sagittal section of a horse's head. Um, you're frantically searching for the lesion and at last you found it and we're again peering into a guttural pouch. This one looks different. It doesn't have a chondroid, so, it, so it's not that kind of strangles and it's not pus filled. It's not a guttural pouch empyema. There's too much organization of this exudate and we do have the hint here that we're dealing with granulomatous inflammation. And if you're in the guttural pouch and you're dealing with uh, fibrinonecrotic or granulomatous inflammation, think of fungus, think specifically of aspergillus, and that was the cause in this case. So your etiologic diagnosis would be guttural pouch aspergillosis and the best morphologic diagnosis I think would be either fibrinonecrotic or granulomatous in gluvitis. Nervous system 13, we're switching gears just a little bit and, and leaving the nervous system per se and, and shifting into special senses and looking at a couple of eyes. They're actually from the same horse, but, but it's the right and the left eye. But both eyes had the same disease. And this is a very, a fairly common lesion in the horse. And you'll notice that, this, that much of this horse's face is white and that specifically his eyelids are white are unpigmented and in this lesion the cornea looks relatively normal no pigment in the iris so it's a blue-eyed horse and the no pigment in the eyelid and we have an ulcerative lesion in that eyelid and this is a, a, a tumor that could be a little bit tough to diagnose if you didn't know it was so common in the horse there's not much bulk to this mass here but if you're dealing with an ulceration, older horse, unpigmented eyelid, most of you are going to leap to the conclusion that it's a squamous cell carcinoma. And we know it is a tumor that often tends to grow down into the tissue rather than projecting up as, and oftentimes does not make a huge mass. Uh, the mass does have a bit more bulk to it in the horse's other eye where it's uh, more in the upper eyelid and notice that this cornea is not normal. So we have a sequestrum here, we have ulceration, we have neovascularization uh, tracking along that cornea towards that necrotic point. So your morphologic diagnosis is squamous cell carcinoma. It's, it's a diagnosis that does not tell you what tissue is involved so you need to be sure to say eyelid or palpebral or something that identifies the tissue. Nervous system 14, we're, we're now in the peripheral nervous system. And the clue to this picture, if you haven't recognized it already, is that this, this is the fold that this intestinal tract belonged to. And if you look at this fold, you see that it's just about unpigmented. But you might guess at the coloration of its parents because you can see not quite red or brown spots along its dorsal midline, but sort of a pink discoloration there that that tells you that it's an ovarial fold but it, it so it's a paint fold ovarial pattern but it's a white ovarial fold that's the name of the disease white ovarial fold disease so that's your clue to tell you to start looking for the lesion that you know 
that um, that this foal should have. And the gross lesion that we see, which of course is very different from the microscopic lesion, is what is often called contracted distal segment. So we fanned out the intestinal tract, the entire intestinal tract of, of this horse, and you'll notice that the small intestine is quite dilated. As a matter of fact, the small intestine is almost as big in circumference or as big in diameter as the large colon, and the opposite should be true. Um, the large colon is sort of unremarkable. Remember, this is a neonatal foal. He's just two or three days old at the time of death. And his large colon is about normal size. His small intestine is way too big. And his small colon, which should be smaller than the large colon, but it shouldn't be this small. And that's the main lesion that you're seeing macroscopically. We call that contracted distal segment. But the real morphologic diagnosis here, the one that you're assuming should be present, is agangliosis. So if you were asked to name the condition in this case, you could call it intestinal agangliosis. And the histologic features then are a complete lack of submucosal and myenteric ganglia in the large intestine. And if you were asked to name the cause, we now know that this is caused by a mutation in the endothelin B receptor gene that does not allow the, 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 the neurons to migrate from the neural crest to their sites in the peripheral nervous system. And the name of this disease, as we've also mentioned, is the lethal white ovaro syndrome or lethal white foal syndrome. So intestinal ganglionosis. And we're switching systems again to the integumentary system, to the skin. The first two pictures are two different foals. Uh, they were weanling foals, and this weanling yearling is about the age when we see this disease. It's not a very important disease, but a relatively common disease. So if we see it at necropsy, we are usually seeing it as an incidental finding. These foals don't die from this disease. They die from something else, and we occasionally will see this disease. So the lesion we're seeing is the presence of multiple small papillary tumors clustered around the muzzle and the lips of this horse, muzzle and lips of this horse, and that is their site of predilection. And because these are common, we can recognize this tumor, and we know that these are squamous papillomas, and more specifically, that they're viral papillomas caused by papillomavirus. Skin slide two is two different foals with the same disease. These were about weanling foals also. And this photo by Art Ortenberger shows a live foal with two protruding nodules. That uh, the, the clinical differential diagnosis for those was either hemangioma or possibly melanoma, partly because these had been present, if not at birth, at least during the neonatal period and hemangiomas and melanocytomas are two tumors that can be juvenile tumors in horses that are often juvenile tumors in horses. The foal on the left has the same tumor and this one was more clearly a hemangioma, a vascular tumor rather than a melanoma. You can see the the indication of vascular compromise here. So the clinicians nailed this one. They did not have a differential diagnosis. And they were right in this case. So, th so this one's a very extensive hemangioma. The other one's, this one's not amenable to surgery. This one on the left, the one here on the right, was treated by surgery. So the morphologic diagnosis for these would be cutaneous hemangioma with the idea that these are developmental problems, that they're often present at birth. Sometimes the term vascular hamartoma is also used. So either one would be correct in that case. Slide three from skin is showing again two different horses that have the same skin disease, the same skin tumor. The very classic presentation is the multiple black nodules of melanoma 
that's the name of the tumor, that's your morphologic diagnosis. You do need to say where it is, so you could say cutaneous melanoma, or you could be even more specific and say perineal melanoma. So we have multiple black nodules extending along the base of the tail of this old gray horse and uh, more around the, the perineal tissue, the, around the anus, around the vulva. Very characteristic appearance. One other place where, now remember these are old horses, the perineal melanoma is an old horse's tumor as opposed to juvenile melanoma that we had in the differential for the hemangioma that we looked at in the muzzle of, of the horse, of the, of, the, of the weanling foal. With the perineal melanoma, it's an old horse's tumor. And another place, a somewhat less common place, but not so very uncommon that you wouldn't diagnose it quickly, and these are usually pigmented melanomas. It's, we don't see all the amelanotic melanomas in horses that we've recognized in dogs. So they are usually black. And if you find a black mass in the parotid area of a horse, you should also go with melanoma. So these two pictures on the left are showing the black mass, base of the ear here, parotid region here, same horse. And a black mass in that region is a melanoma. And these tumors are potentially malignant. So we do use the term melanoma. A lot of times for the juvenile tumors, we would use the term melanocytoma because those tumors are almost always benign. Integumentary system four, we're getting another dose of a tumor. These are actually pictures from two different horses. The, and, and both horses were young adult horses. Uh, typical ages for this tumor are three or four years of age. Uh, maybe as old as six. They are not usually old horses. They are also not usually weanlings or yearlings. So, so young adults and uh, very common tumor in horses. So you've probably already jumped to a diagnosis of equine sarcoid. That's the name of that tumor. Uh, fairly characteristic appearance um, to be a flat disc-like mass here. They are commonly multiple and this horse does have two of them. And the other way that they can look is to be a very big, bulky, fibroblastic tumor. And the quickest way to convert it from the flat verrucous form to the big, bulky, fibroblastic form is to, um, is to do a biopsy. And so this horse has a combination. It has a, a mixture of the flat form and the big, bulky form here. And the cause of this tumor is bovine papilloma virus either type 1 or type 2 usually. Integumentary system 5, these are pictures from Richard Miller, a disease that he was an expert in, still is an expert in now that he's back in Australia. And the clinical picture shows the foot of a horse. The foot is the typical site for this lesion. And the lesion is an ulcerated nodular mass. So you're going to go with granulomatous dermatitis and you could add ulcerative as a modifier. If you're recognizing the disease as pithiosis, then you can also add eosinophilic as a modifier. So the very best morphologic diagnosis would be ulcerative eosinophilic granulomatous dermatitis. When we look at these on cross-section, we see, again, a, a fibrous mass, granulomatous, nodules within that fibrous mass and the characteristic formation of these yellow sulfur granules or conkers or leeches as they're known that clues us in that the cause is pythium insidiosum. Integumentary system slide six. Sometimes I think it's very difficult to make a, a morphologic diagnosis in just a few words for, for dermatitis. And so in this case, it might be easier to ask you the cause rather than, than to ask you for a morphologic. What you're seeing is crusting, um, hyperkeratosis, erythema. The lesion seems to be localized in the muzzle of the horse. We've added a clue because you might have been thinking of a couple of different causes, but we've added a clue, and this is one of those bacteria that has a, such a characteristic appearance that we can diagnose it cytologically or histologically and we are seeing a long filamentous branching bacteria that's composed of chains of coccoid bodies and that gives you your diagnosis or your cause of dermatophilosis or dermatophilus congolensis. So the cause is dermatophilus congolensis.
um, a, again with this idea that it's sometimes very hard to make a morphologic diagnosis for dermatitis. I'm showing you another picture of dermatitis and this time instead of asking you to make a morphologic diagnosis, I would ask you to name, to name the cause or to name the condition or to describe the histologic pattern. And I think you can appreciate that the horse has patchy alopecia, the skin is pink, those are the main things you're seeing. You're probably already getting the idea that this horse is rubbing its hair off rather than its hair just falling out, that this disease itches. And that should clue you in to an etiologic diagnosis of allergic dermatitis. And if you were asked for the histologic pattern, you would know that it's one of our most common histologic patterns and it's perivascular eosinophilic superficial dermatitis. So that could be a morphologic diagnosis, but I think it's easier to ask for it as a pattern. So allergic dermatitis in a horse with the characteristic pattern of superficial eosinophilic perivascular dermatitis. We're looking at another example of superficial eosinophilic perivascular dermatitis. This time we're focused on the midline, the ventral midline of a horse, and we're seeing alopecia as a result of the pruritus, the horse is rubbing this area and scarring, it's a more chronic lesion and the location this time is telling us what causes to think of. And if we see that there's an allergic type dermatitis, if we're suspecting this perivascular eosinophilic reaction, then we should be thinking of a hypersensitivity type reaction. If it's focused on the midline, think of either the flybite hypersensitivity, in other words, culicoides hypersensitivity, or think that it's the larval, the larvae migrating in the skin of Onchocerca cervicalis. This is where the larvae like to live and they may cause the dermatitis, but because the larvae like to live there, the flies like to bite there, and so it may be a flybite dermatitis. Sometimes it's difficult to figure out which it is, and it's possible it's both. Um, hard to say. Integumentary systems, uh, slide nine, these are photos by Eleanor Green, clinical photos. One to show that the entire horse's body is affected, and, and then a close-up of the face to show a couple of things. That the lesion we're seeing is the shedding of these leaf-like scales all over the skin. It's a very hyperkeratotic disease. It's also exudative, so we get the idea that the hair is matted together and that there's crust formation in addition to just the hyperkeratosis. Also it's important to note, and this might be more important to note in animals that more commonly have mucocutaneous skin disease, that the mucocutaneous junction that we can see here, the eyelid, is normal. It's spared. So this is a disease that is sparing the mucocutaneous junction. Morphologic diagnosis um, in this case or name of the condition is pemphigus foliaceus. If you were asked to name the histologic features of this, remember that, that this is a pustular disease, that the pustules are acantholytic, they form under the stratum corneum. So you could say subcorneal pustules um, with acantholytic keratinocytes plus or minus eosinophils. Integumentary system 10, morphologic diagnosis, sole abscess. We're looking at the sole here. We can see that most of the sole is lost. Um, we're, we're looking at the bottom of the foot and it's been pared out and treated, so we don't actually see the abscess per se, but remember that sole abscesses, might, they may migrate down and, and cause this loss of the sole. They also migrate up and the hoof wall keeps them from rupturing until they get past the hoof wall and so where they always break out to the surface at the end of these fistulous tracts is right at the coronary band. So morphologic diagnosis in this case, sole abscess. Slide 11 is a sagittal section of the foot of a horse. We looked in an example of chronic laminitis earlier where we were seeing a thick band of white fibrous connective tissue. This time we are looking at an acute case of laminitis. So laminitis is our morphologic diagnosis, also the name of the disease. 
and we need to recognize with a modifier or two that it is an acute disease in this, in this case. So we could say hemorrhagic necrotizing. We can see that we have separation of the lamina at the, between the hoof wall and, and the third phalanx, and we have hemorrhage in that zone, and we have the beginning of rotation. We have just a degree or two of rotation away from being parallel with the hoof wall. So necrotizing hemorrhagic laminitis would be a good morphologic diagnosis. And pathogenesis, you could take a couple of approaches, and it's still a little bit controversial. We think trauma may be a very important factor. Some of these start as endotoxemia or even exogenous toxemias. Um, sometimes it's as simple as carbohydrate overload. We think the initial event is a degeneration of the epidermal lamina and then subsequently you get loss of blood supply, necrosis, and hemorrhage of the tissue. Okay, we are switching to the last system for, for this session and uh, starting at the front and we'll work to the back. So uh, this is looking at the horse's mouth and I think it might be a little tough to make a morphologic diagnosis in this case, so instead I would ask you the cause of this horrible erosion and fracture of the teeth, and you'll note also that there is considerable proliferation of the oral mucosa in the hard palate here behind the teeth, so upper teeth here. We also can see that there are ulcerations, so there's way too much to make a morphologic diagnosis. I want you to tell me what caused this lesion, and this is the result of, of a vice that's the self-induced. This is the result. This horse is a chronic cribber, so this is caused by cribbing for years and years horrible damage to the teeth. Uh, moving on through the alimentary tract, we're in the esophagus now, just uh, caudal to the pharynx, and two pictures of the same specimen, um, one with the impacted bolus of feedstuffs that had lodged here and caused choke or esophageal obstruction, so that could be one morphologic diagnosis. When we remove that bolus of impacted food, we see that there are also esophageal ulcers, your second morphologic diagnosis, as a result of the trauma in the, in the compression from that mass of impacted food. Moving into the stomach now, these are photos by Pepe Ramos, two pictures of the same horse's stomach, and the non-glandular mucosa looks relatively normal, but all of, almost all of the glandular mucosa is abnormal and it's affected by multiple and coalescing shallow ulcers. So the morphologic diagnosis in this case would be gastric ulceration. I think it would also be okay to call it ulcerative gastritis. And this was in a young horse. The cause in this case was non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, specifically phenylbutazone. Another horse's stomach. Um, an example of something with two lesions or two diagnoses, and the thing that maybe jumps out at you first is there's an awful lot of bots in this stomach. And so to name that organism, um, the most likely gastrophilus species that this would be would be intestinalis. So the organism name is gastrophilus intestinalis, but we have another lesion that gastrophilus is not responsible for, and that's this lesion in the center of the slide. Remember, sometimes it's a good idea to look in the center of the slide to find your lesion. Here's the lesion. Nodular mass has a little umbilication with a plug there, and the inset is showing that nodular mass cut and cross-section. We can see that it's mostly a fibrous mass, but in the middle of it, maybe you can make out it's full of worms, full of nematode-type worms. And uh, that, that lesion, you should make a morphologic diagnosis of granuloma because it's nodular and because you can assume it's inflammatory since there are worms in the middle to I'd, you have to add the word gastric, and you could even add the word submucosal to very precisely identify the location of it. So gastric submucosal granuloma. You could add with interlesional nematodes, and the name of those nematodes or the cause of that lesion is drasha megastoma. <laughs>
Elementary slide five, we're in the intestinal tract now, and we see a very segmental lesion in just one loop of small intestine where there is hemorrhagic necrosis of that segment of the small intestine. So the morphologic diagnosis would be segmental hemorrhagic necrosis of the small intestine. And the cause, it's hard to say from, the, from what we're seeing what the cause is. You might think of entrapment, something that cut off the blood supply. It could be an infarct. You can see the, the mesenteric vessels coming down through the mesentery there. It could be an infarct. It could be simply entrapment. This time, uh, we're looking at another segment of intestine. The lesion is intestinal strangulation and obstruction. You could use that as a morphologic diagnosis, or you could go again with segmental hemorrhagic necrosis of the small intestine. This time, we know the cause, and we can actually see the cause. If I can get the pointer to work, there we go. Um, here is the cause. This is a lipoma, very common lesion in older horses, a mesenteric lipoma. Every once in a while, horses often have 10 or 15 of these, and every once in a while, one of them will form a pedunculated stalk and manage to loop itself around a segment of intestinal tract and effectively strangulate it. Um, here's one where, uh, this is a Paul Stromberg, uh, or this is Forrest, not Paul Stromberg didn't take this picture, but the picture's for him because he likes parasites, and I do too, actually. Um, parasites is about all you can see in this picture of partially open small intestines, and in this case, I just want you to name the intestine. The only horseworm that's this big and can get this numerous that I know of is Parascaris equorum. And this is usually a parasite of young horses, so usually foals that get such massive infections. Another parasitic lesion, this time we're looking at a segment of small intestine, probably in the ileum, and we see these red hemorrhagic plaques on the serosal surface. Remember that a morphologic diagnosis is the name of the lesion. The name of this lesion is hemomelasma ilii, and it's fine to use that as a morphologic diagnosis. Slide nine is three cross sections of the same ileum of a horse, and the lesion is a thickening of the inner layer of the tunica muscularis. So essentially the, the mucosa is normal. The submucosa may be a tiny bit thickened, but I think it's more that we have a compromise of the luminal diameter, so that may be more relative thickening. And the serosa looks normal. The outer muscle layer, which is sort of muscle colored, is normal. But the inner muscle layer, the inner layer of the tunica muscularis, is too pale, way too thick, and almost bulges because of the hypertrophy. So the morphologic diagnosis in this case is smooth muscle hypertrophy and parenthetically ileum. Um, you might, you could just say small intestine, but this is usually a lesion of the ileum, so that would be a good guess. Idiopathic lesion, we, or at least I don't know what causes it. Elementary system slide, not, uh, slide 10, sorry, is a rather complicated picture. We're looking at the thoracic and abdominal cavities of a horse, and we're seeing lesions in both cavities and in multiple organs. So it's a little bit tough to make a morphologic diagnosis, one that you're probably going to have to make multiple morphologic diagnoses. The thing that will jump out at you, and probably your first morphologic diagnosis, therefore, would be separative lymphadenitis or lymph nodal abscesses. But there's really more abscesses than there are lymph nodes. So I think separative lymphadenitis um, even separative peritonitis would be good. Um, you can see the larger ones here. They track along the, where the vessels track along, the large colon here, um, into the cecum. Uh, they're in the mesentery, everywhere the, where the horse has lymphoid tissue, it's making these abscesses. If you look a little bit harder, you'll notice that the horse has rather similar but often smaller abscesses in the lung. So we can go separative lymphadenitis or, or nodal abscessation. But uh, we need to add the morphologic diagnosis of pulmonary abscesses. And we're starting to get a picture here that this horse may have a disease which you have recognized at this point. And the disease that this horse has is infection with Rhodococcus equi. 
And we know that the, when we get the enteric form of that disease, we know that the lesion is ulcerative tiflocolitis. I think it would be very prudent to add and very precise to correct to add the diagnosis of ulcerative tiflocolitis because you have recognized the, the disease. And that also tells you that the cause is rhodococcus equi. Progressing through the alimentary system, this time we're looking at two pictures um, from different horses actually, but with the same problem. And the, the major problem that this horse had, the life-threatening problem that it had was intussusception of the ileum, shown here, dilated here, and the distal part of the ileum has, has telescoped into the cecum. So the cecum has been opened so that you can see that, and here's the necrotic strangulated segment of ileum intussuscepted into the cecum. So ileocecal intussusception is the major diagnosis here. When you see that lesion, you will often find this organis organism, and that is the tapeworm that's called Anaplocephala perfoliata, and it's right at the ileocecal orifice. Um, a quick one, alimentary system, what was you know this is going to be a volvulus because you can see the strangulation obstruction. You'll notice that almost the entire large colon is involved, and it's red, it's dead, and the morphologic diagnosis for this would be colonic volvulus. This one's a little bit different. We're looking at large colon again, but you'll notice that most of the large colon looks okay. It's not a volvulus. We just have the right dorsal part of the large colon affected by hemorrhagic necrosis. And this is right dorsal colitis. And we know that this is caused by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Another parasitic lesion, this is opened large intestine, cecum. And we are looking at many worms. When we see that many worms and they're that small, think of small strongyles, cyathostomes. In addition to the worms, we can see some worm lesions. And those are those red umbilicated nodules shown there, there, there. A very important cause of diarrhea and death in horses is salmonella infection. And in this piece, uh, there's Margarita telling us it's a mule. We see green discoloration of the mucosa, telling us that the mucosa is dead. We see the vascular compromise reflected as edema in the submucosa. Necrotizing colitis should be your morphologic diagnosis. And Salmonella typhimurium is the culprit. And the last slide is, the, is a rectal perforation in a horse. Anus here and a probe inserted through, or a steel actually inserted through the defect caused by rectal palpation. Rapidly fatal lesion in horses. And that concludes our alimentary system. We'll, we'll start with a new system in the next session. Welcome back to Diseases of the Horse. In this last of three segments, we will start with the hepatobiliary system and work through the remaining body systems. In the first slide, we are looking at the liver of a horse, and I included a ruler to or a, a yardstick, a meter stick, to show the massive size of this liver. You'll also appreciate that the liver is swollen with rounded edges. It's very dark, and blood is oozing from, from all vessels underneath the liver. And in the cross section, we see the classic nutmeg pattern. So this is the nutmeg liver lesion. The, uh, the condition then is chronic passive hepatic congestion. And this leads us to think of right heart failure with, uh, with passive congestion, degeneration and death of central lobular hepatocytes and replacement by fibrosis so that we get that reticulated pattern. Now contrast this very large, swollen, congested liver to this liver. Same size horse, much smaller liver. Um, this is Robert Johnson, one of our residents at Purdue, holding this liver up. He would not have been able to pick up the, the liver from the previous slide. But this liver is not only small enough and lightweight to, to easily hold within an extended arm, but you'll also notice that how it sags and droops. This disease has often been called dish rag liver. And the morphologic diagnosis in this case would be massive hepatic necrosis. 
We know that histologically we would not only see massive hepatic necrosis but that we would see post necrotic collapse and that's what gives us the loss of texture and the sagging nature of this liver. And this leads us then to a diagnosis um, of uh, or for the disease entity actually several options that we have it's uh, often called idiopathic acute hepatic disease it's called Tyler's disease that's its eponymous name and it's most commonly I think called equine serum hepatitis the cause is usually an injectable biologic of equine origin several weeks before the death of the horse Slide three is a foal, and we can tell that it's a foal when we're looking at the abdominal and thoracic cavity, mainly by the very small size of the digestive tract in this foal. The lesions that we're seeing are a liver that's too big, so hepatomegaly, also splenomegaly, shown here. And the third lesion that we should recognize and should make a morphologic diagnosis of is icterus. So we're seeing yellow discoloration of tissues that should be white. Focusing on the liver, the liver is shown in cross-section in the upper picture, and we see something we've seen before, multiple randomly distributed foci of pale necrosis. We know it's a foal. We know we have multifocal hepatic necrosis or multifocal necrotizing hepatitis. Either would be a good morphologic diagnosis, and that leads us to a disease name of Tizer's disease, and the cause then is Clostridium piliforme. Slide four is an adult horse. We're looking at a cross section of the liver. And there's several things to note and, and way too many things to make morphologic diagnoses for it. I mean, you will notice that the liver is, is pale, that it's yellow, that again, we have a reticulated lobular pattern with white, um, white lines running through the tissue indicating that there's fibrosis here. Um, but maybe the most striking thing is the fact that bile ducts are full of gravel. So it's a case of intrahepatic cholelithiasis. Uh, the upper picture in the upper right corner shows the cholelith's um, ex situ. So a condition diagnosis, or the name of the condition, would be intrahepatic cholelithiasis. And histologic features that you would expect to find would be bile duct proliferation, peribiliary fibrosis, and because we know that this is often associated with uh, enteric infection that, that ascends up the biliary tree into the liver, you might also expect there to be cholangiohepatitis. Slide five is a surface view of the liver shown in the lower right picture and a cross section of liver in the upper left. If we're looking at the capsule of the liver, the lesion that we're seeing are serpiginous raised tracts with uh, obviously some fibrosis, some hemorrhage, some inflammation. The serpiginous nature of these and their tract-like formation and their capsular location in the liver, the knowledge that it's a horse should all lead us to think of larval migraines, especially large strongyles, and that should tell us that this is very likely eosinophilic inflammation in addition to the fibrosis that we can detect. So eosinophilic capsulitis, Hepatic capsulitis would be a good morphologic diagnosis for that lesion. It's actually the same lesion that we're seeing in cross-section, but now we're looking at nodules. So we should think of granulomatous hepatitis. Again, partly because we saw the hepatic capsule, we are thinking of a parasitic lesion. So eosinophilic granulomatous hepatitis would be a good morphologic diagnosis. And the cause in this case was strongylus vulgaris larvae. Switching to the urinary system, we're looking at a close-up of kidney. Several things that we note that are wrong. One, there's a color change. It's not liver brown. It's pale gray or tan. But the more important lesion in this case is the presence of innumerable cysts. They're usually, well, some of them are probably microscopic, but they don't get much bigger than about two millimeters in diameter. Very importantly, they're small. They're very numerous. So this is a case of polycystic kidney, and that 
is the, also the proper morphologic diagnosis. Another close-up of a kidney from a horse, this time instead of cysts, we have solid deposits of something. They could be mistaken for small abscesses, but in this case these deposits are white and chalky, and if you had your knife in your hand you'd appreciate that they're also gritty. And this is nephrocalcinosis, or you could say renal cortical, multifocal renal cortical mineralization. And the cause in this case was consumption consumption of cestrum diurnum. Remember that's a vitamin D analog, so it's causing hypercalcemia and metastatic calcification affects multiple tissues, including in this case, the kidney. This is a sagittal section of a kidney from a foal. We are again looking at a lesion that seems to be mainly in the cortex, but this kidney is reddened and the lesions have a yellowish cast telling us that they are abscesses and you could say multifocal renal cortical abscesses but recognizing this disease you could make a better morphologic diagnosis of embolic nephritis and that implies that it's multifocal that it's mainly in the cortex it also implies that it's separative so it's not necessary to say separative embolic nephritis. So the, the best morphologic diagnosis is embolic nephritis and in a foal the classic cause for this is actinobacillus equili. And the histologic lesion is the presence of, of bacterial emboli and microabscesses or clusters of neutrophils in glomerular capillaries and peritubular capillaries. Slide four from the urinary system is an external view of the kidney of a horse with coalescing granulomatous lesions. So your morphologic diagnosis would be multifocal granulomatous nephritis. Notice that some of these granulomas are coalescing to form rather large, almost tumor-like masses. This is a fairly characteristic appearance of a rather unusual lesion, parasitic lesion, and the cause in this case is halocephalobus delatrix used to be known as Micronema delatrix, which was easier to say, now called Halocephalobus delatrix, granulomatous nephritis. Slide five from the urinary system is an external view and a sagittal section, cut section view of, of the kidneys of a horse that had cystitis, bacterial cystitis with ascending infection of the kidney. So we should make, therefore, a morphologic diagnosis of pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is usually separative. It doesn't hurt to add that. Um, we're not seeing so much granulomas here as we are seeing abscesses that are raised above the cortical surface. So this is separative inflammation. By definition, remember that pyelonephritis involves the renal pelvis, shown here, and the renal parenchyma. So you need to find inflammation in both tissues to make that diagnosis. But it also implies that it's an ascending infection, usually bacterial, and so in addition to the pyelonephritis, in this case we also need to make a morphologic diagnosis of ureteritis. So that tube is also inflamed, that tube is also dilated, and there's yet a third diagnosis that often accompanies pyelonephritis. It doesn't have to, and it also can exist alone, but it's a frequent companion to pyelonephritis and is shown very well in this horse as a crumbling and loss of texture at the renal crest. So our third morphologic diagnosis in this case would be renal crest necrosis, or you could call it medullary necrosis. Here's an example in slide six of a horse kidney that has multiple foci of medullary necrosis, but not that diffuse renal crest necrosis that we saw in the previous horse. And this horse also is lacking any evidence of pyelonephritis. So we need to look for another cause for renal medullary necrosis in this horse. And this term is often, or this lesion is often called papillary necrosis or renal papillary necrosis, but the horse doesn't really have a renal papilla, so medullary necrosis is a better term. 
And the other reason that we should think about in this horse that has medullary necrosis without pyelonephritis is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And the one that's used the most in horses is phenylbutazone, and that was the culprit in this case. Remember that phenylbutazone will very consistently cause this lesion in a horse if the horse is also dehydrated. So it really seems to take both. It takes that, that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that causes vasoconstriction and ischemic damage to the renal medullary tissue, and it takes dehydration to, to exacerbate that and produce the lesion. Slide seven from the urinary system, the, the resident helping me with this case did a little bit of trickery. The, the stone that we're looking at that we can see here was planted here for the picture. The stone was actually found here in the penile urethra. And you can see that for penile urethra, it's a large stone and it was obstructing. So urethral obstruction by a urolith was the cause for this necrotizing and hemorrhagic ulcerative cystitis. A lot of modifiers you could use here. So the stone's been artificially planted there, but the lesion that you're seeing there is a fibrinonecrotic membrane to the urinary bladder. Make a diagnosis of cystitis, modify it with fibrinonecrotic or ulcerative or hemorrhagic, and the cause in this case was urethral obstruction by that urolith with urine stasis and secondary bacterial infection. We're switching now to the respiratory system and these sections, these cross sections of lung are from a horse fetus that was aborted late in gestation and one side of its lung was normal, the other side of its lung was transformed into a tumor-like mass. And in this picture, the top lobe or the cross section of the lobe that's shown at the top of the slide is the abnormal one with the obvious mass. And for comparison, we have a normal lobe cross sectioned at the bottom. And what you'll notice about, if I can get, yeah, there we go. What you'll notice about the normal lung lobe is that you can see airways. It's lung, it should have airways. This is a term fetus. It should be a well developed lung. It does have multiple cross sections of airways throughout the lobe. In this top section, we can see that we can see the mass effect beginning or, or demarcated from normal lung right here. So as we approach the hilar region of the lung, the tissue's normal and it has vessels and it has airways that we can see in cross section. As we progress into this mass, we notice a change. Not only is the tissue expanded, it's a little bit paler. Um, but very importantly, we have no cartilaginous airways that we can detect macroscopically. This lesion, the morphologic diagnosis for this, or the name of this lesion is pulmonary hamartoma, and um, it is a fatal lesion, probably more commonly seen in horse fetuses than in other animals. Slide two from the respiratory system, two pictures from the same horse. We're looking at the open thoracic cavity to get an idea of the disseminated nature of these nodular or granulomatous lesions. So already we have a diagnosis of granulomatous pneumonia. We can see that it's well disseminated. That's giving us the idea that, um, that we're dealing with an embolic origin rather than an erogenous. The horse didn't inspire this infectious agent. The, it spread from somewhere through the, blood, through the bloodstream and arrived at the lung in that way. So nodular lesions, granulomatous pneumonia, uncut section, we're basically seeing the same thing. Nodular lesions of granuloma or granulomatous inflammation disseminated throughout the lobe and cross section. And this is one way that a disease that we've seen before can look, and this is rotococcus equi infection in a horse. This is another way that rotococcus equi infection can look. So we're looking at a different horse. Again, it has nodular lesions. They're not as evenly distributed. distributed. They still have a, a pattern that's not craniovental, so it's still consistent with embolic origin. That's probably how the lesions got there. But uh, they're they're more randomly distributed. They're also much larger. They're still granulomas. Uh, some of them may be more like pyogranulomas. If you call them abscesses, that wouldn't really be a problem in, in this case because there's certainly a, a purulent component to them.
So pulmonary abscesses or pulmonary pyogranulomas for a morphologic diagnosis. And again, the cause is Rhodococcus equi. Slide four, there's Margarita telling us that this is a donkey. And this was a donkey foal. And it's one of those cases where it is helpful to know specifically what kind of an animal, not just that it's an equid, but that it's a donkey f and that it's a donkey foal. Because this is a disease that has been recognized as a problem in donkey foals. Now notice that in this case we're dealing again with pneumonia. In the cross section you can see that the lung is reddened. You can see that the distribution is pretty much diffuse. Even though we have some modeling that gives us a multifocal characteristic, it's spread throughout the lung. So we're not thinking of bronchopneumonia, we're thinking of interstitial pneumonia, and that would be a very good morphologic diagnosis. You do also see areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. You can see those beneath the pleura here. You can see them on the cross sections. You could add hemorrhagic, or you could add necrotizing, but you'd be safe with just a diagnosis of interstitial pneumonia. And this is specifically the gamma herpes virus infection that occurs in donkey foals and causes a fatal interstitial pneumonia in them. The histologic features of this, in addition to the interstitial pneumonia, there's also necrotizing bronchiolitis and the exudate, the cellular infiltrate, is composed of macrophages and neutrophils and syncytial cells that act as a tip-off that is a herpes virus infection. Um, this time in, in slide five, we're looking at an adult horse's lung, and again we see nodular lesions. This time they're red, so it's telling us that they're hemorrhagic, but they're multifocal nodular lesions that are disseminated through all lobes of the lung. They're as likely to be dorsal as they are ventral. It's telling us again that this is an embolic infection that it arrived through the bloodstream, that it's not the erogenous bronchopneumonia that we maybe see more commonly. So a very good morphologic diagnosis for this case would be embolic pneumonia. And uh, what we're seeing mainly grossly is hemorrhage, but remember that embolic implies that it's usually going to be a separative or maybe a granulomatous inflammation. So morphologic diagnosis, embolic pneumonia, and pathogenesis, remember to think of septicemia. It could be bacterial, could be fungal, and is spreading from somewhere through the bloodstream to the lung. Respiratory slide six, we've looked at one of these pictures before when we were talking about the philosophy of making a morphologic diagnosis. These are actually, this is a composite of two different cases of the same lung tumor. And what I wanted to show in this, this picture of the entire lungs, of both lungs, is that this tumor tends to involve only one lung. Often it's the right lung, doesn't have to be, but it tends to involve just one lung. It's a fairly massive tumor by the time the horses die. And as the bronchial tree is opened, we find that the tumor projects into bronchial lumina as these nodular masses. And we used this earlier as an example of something that would cause mucopurulent or curtaral inflammation that's secondary to the obstruction by the tumor nodules. But the, so we're dealing with the tumor. The horse's most common lung tumor is pulmonary granular cell tumor, and uh, that would be your morphologic. So the morphologic diagnosis for a tumor is the name of the tumor. Granular cell tumor could occur at other sites. It doesn't very often in the horse, but it could. So remember to say granular cell tumor of the lung or pulmonary granular cell tumor. You do have to also identify the site. Um, here's one where in slide seven where you would have a hard time telling what you were looking at, but I tried to include at least a, a rim of the liver here, a little bit of diaphragm showing there and gastrointestinal tract here. So we know that we're looking right at the thoracoabdominal junction. So we must be peering into the thorax and we are and it's a mess. And basically all you can see is exudate in this case. Because we're in the thorax, you know that the tissue that's involved is the pleura. So if there's exudate and there's pleura involved, your noun is pleuritis. Your modifiers, I think fibrinonecrotic would be good. Hemorrhagic would be good to throw in there. So necrohemorrhagic, fibrinonecrotic, something like that. But pleuritis is the important word here. In this particular case, the cause was streptococcus equi subspecies Zoepidemicus, but I don't know that there's any way that you could 
tell that from the picture. So it could be some other bacteria. Switched, um, we're still in the respiratory system, but we switched to the nasal cavity now. So some things to help you identify the tissue, cribriform plate here, teeth here, hard palate there, and we're centered here in the nasal cavity. There's a mass, so we're going to think granuloma or tumor. And you notice within this mass, this time we got lucky, and within this mass that there are actual uh, fungal mats. And so this should give us a diagnosis of a morphologic diagnosis of a nasal granuloma. And the most likely cause, if we actually see these fungal mats like this, would be Aspergillus fumigatus. Okay, switching systems to the cardiovascular system. And uh, first slide is the only cardiac defect I'm going to show you, easy to find in this case, and fairly large, and right under the aortic valve, which is its most common place to be, is just barely subvalvular, is a ventricular septal defect. So when you're dealing with anomalies, the morphologic diagnosis is the name of the anomaly. So ventricular septal defect. Um, this happened to be a mule, this heart. Uh, so we're looking at the whole heart and seeing a modeling effect so that pale myocardial tissue is mixed with more normal colored myocardial tissue. That effect or that lesion is even more apparent on cross-section of the heart where we see extensive pallor of, of the heart. And that clues us in. The pallor in, in muscular tissue tells us that we have a degenerative process going on. It could be necrosis. If you're not confident, if you, you, know, if you can't see some mineralization to help out, or if you can't see obvious loss of structure, you can just call it myocardial degeneration. So myocardial degeneration would be a good morphologic diagnosis. You could add necrosis if you were brave. Differential diagnosis here, you should think about plant toxins. We thought that this case was due to consumption of the poisonous plant white snake root. Uh, monensin would be another possibility or, or other ionophores. Slide three from the cardiovascular system is showing a chronic inflammatory lesion in which we see plaques of organizing and fibrosing exudate on the epicardium. So morphologic diagnosis for this would be fibrosing epicarditis, cause unknown in this case. Slide four is the heart of an older horse and we're centered on the aortic valve here. And you'll notice that there's a hole in the ascending aorta some centimeters away from the valve. And not surprisingly, massive hemorrhage around that site. So this is aortic rupture in the horse. We very often do not know the cause for this lesion. They are usually somewhat older horses, but very often we find no predisposing lesion in the aorta, and that was the, the case in, in this particular horse. These uh, ruptures sometimes will occur a little bit closer to the base of the heart and bleed into the pericardial sac. But in this case, there was no hemopericardium, and the hemorrhage happened around the ascending aorta and then dissected along the thoracic aorta. Very rapid death, typically. Looking again at an aortic valve, an ascending aorta, this time we're in a, in a younger horse. And remember, we see serpiginous tracts in a horse. We should think of, of strongyle larval migration. This is one site, of course, the craniomesenteric artery is their favorite site, but it's, with heavy infections, it's fairly common to see these lesions in horses, especially in the days before ivermectin. So a good morphologic diagnosis for this would be eosinophilic endoarteritis to indicate that the lesion is pretty much confined to the intima of the vessel and the culprit's strongylus vulgaris. <laughs>
Um, I know that Strongyl sphagyrus, since the advent of ivermectin use, is somewhat of a historic disease, but we in fact still do see it from time to time. Some horse owners are, get a little bit careless or a little bit uh, nonchalant about Strongyl sphagyrus, which used to be a major killer of horses. And so we will still see the lesion from time to time. And I think it helps to remember where to look for the lesions and to remember that it can be a killer in horses. And uh, remember its preferred site is the cranial mesenteric artery. That's where the larvae like to mature. So this photo by Tom Cly is showing one of his research ponies with Strongylus vulgaris larval migration. And the artery ha is thick walled. It has a dilated lumen. It has thrombi. It has worms in it and plenty of eosinophilic inflammation. Another place, we, we've already looked at that lesion in the ascending aorta and we've talked about renal infarcts being a common place for, for Strongylus vulgaris uh, lesions to appear. And that's not surprising when you remember how close the origin of the renal arteries is to the cranial mesenteric artery. In this case, we're looking at an opened abdominal aorta. This is the orifice of the cranial mesenteric artery. This is a very chronic lesion, a very old horse and there's no active arteritis here now, but the, but the artery is dilated, and the artery also has, has fibrosis and actual ossification bone formation in the wall. But the reason I show you this picture is to show you what chronic uh, verminous arteritis can look like, but also to show you the renal arteries and their very close proximity to the craniomesenteric artery. So there's craniomesenteric, here's right and left renal arteries. That's why you get renal infarcts with Strongyl vulgaris larval migration. But another place that we're likely, in addition to the cranial mesenteric artery, to see severe arteritis is in the colic arteries. And remember, they run as two paired structures mm -hmm. along the, the left and right um, large colon. And so the, here we're seeing worms and thrombosis and wall thickening in the colic arteries. Very common place to see the lesion, and in large lymph nodes and edema. Some other strongyl, strongylus vulgaris larval lesions that I had the privilege to see when, when I had the opportunity to work with Tom Cly, parasitologist at Louisiana State University. One, in addition to kidneys, a common place that we would see infarcts was in the tip of the cecum. And that's shown in this experimentally infected pony. So the, the sequel artery is going to run down this way, so it's kind of an end artery situation, and that's why it's very prone to less opportunity for anastomosis there and very prone to infarction. Still in the cardiovascular system, we're looking at infarcts in the spleen, and those may appear at the tip of the spleen and in proximity to the arterial system here, or, but very often they're, they're near the arteries but closer to the edge of the spleen. Splenic infarcts tend to be hemorrhagic despite their, whether they're acute or chronic. So they will usually bulge, they'll fill with blood, and they will often be larger than, or they'll be expanded by the infarction. Okay, switch now to the, and that showing a spleen is kind of a lead into the hematopoietic system. Margarita's here to tell us that this was a donkey foal. And uh, again, you can tell it's a foal because we're looking at abdominal cavity. It's mostly small intestine, and we don't see the, the large colon. The large colon is not very large yet, so we can guess that it's a foal. And in fact, it was a neonatal foal. The lesions that we're seeing, one is icterus, so yellow discoloration of tissues that should be close to white. So it has icterus. Um, the liver is too big, so the morphologic diagnosis for that is hepatomegaly. And the spleen is too big, and the morphologic diagnosis for that is splenomegaly, or you could say that it's diffuse splenomegaly to indicate that there's no mass here. And the disease in, in this foal was neonatal isoimmune erythrolysis. Second slide from hematopoietic system, we're looking at the spleen again, and we notice that even before we can find the spleen that there's a lot of hemorrhage there. 
So one morphologic diagnosis we should make is hemoperitoneum. If we look a little bit more closely at the spleen, we've cleaned away the blood now in this inset and flipped the spleen up so that we're looking at the visceral surface rather than the parietal surface of the spleen, and we can see the rent or the tear in the spleen that was a source of the hemorrhage. So the morphologic diagnosis for that could be splenic laceration or splenic rupture to explain the other morphologic diagnosis of hemoperitoneum. Hematopoietic system slide three, the, the standout feature in this picture is massive splenomegaly. So the morphologic diagnosis is splenomegaly, really a big spleen. And that's about all that we can see in this slide. So then we just need to think of the things that cause diffuse splenomegaly. And you're always going to think with horses that it could just be a simple matter of it was euthanized with pentobarbital, and we know that that can cause pretty massive splenomegaly. But this horse died on its own, so we have to look for other causes. And in this case, the horse had an anemic disease, and that seemed to be the congestion, and the hematopoiesis seemed to be the cause for splenomegaly in this horse. Splenic lymphoma would certainly be a rule out, and we'll look at a case of that in, in a couple of slides, a couple of slides from now. Slide four is not, not our example of hepatic or splenic lymphoma, but we are looking at some splenomegaly, but more importantly, we have a focal mass in the spleen. And you'll notice even before we look at the cut section of that, that it is associated with a lot of capsulitis and peritonitis, so that the capsule of the spleen, it's a chronic lesion actually, the capsule of the spleen is adhered by organizing fibrous connective tissue to other tissues uh, such as the liver, such as the diaphragm, um, such as the stomach. And then when we pull that spleen away and clean it up and cut it longitudinally through that, then we see the purulent exudate that's telling us it is an abscess. And the peritonitis that we saw, the capsulitis, was also a clue that it was an abscess rather than lymphoma. And here's the example of lymphoma. And this time it's not, it, there probably is diffuse splenomegaly, but more importantly, we have a mass. It's a huge mass. And on cut section, I mean, before the cut section, when you're looking at the surface of the spleen, you might wonder, is it going to be an abscess? Is this a sack of pus? Is this a big tumor? If it's a tumor, you're going to think of lymphoma. And now that we've cut it, you can see that it is a solid mass. It is a tumor. So this is an example of lymphoma in the spleen of a horse, which would be the most common tumor for the spleen. Horses get lymphoma in several sites of predilection, which tend to differ a little bit from the sites of predilection that other species have. And uh, this uh, composite of pictures from three different horses shows that, that in equine, equ in equids, there is a propensity to develop lymphoma in the upper respiratory tract. So in this photo by Pepe Ramos, we see that lymphoma is expanding the nasal mucosa and the subcutis. In this picture from a different horse, we see a mass formation in, in the oropharyngeal region. To orient you, there's epiglottis, of course, there with the esophagus going that way. And this is the base of the tongue here. So it's tucked back into the oropharynx. And that mass was lymphoma. Here's yet another horse. This is a cross-section of trachea with the dorsal ligament open there. And again, lymphoma in the submucosa, the upper respiratory tract. And notice that in all these cases, well, this one may be a little bit tough to see, but in these two bottom pictures, that lymphoma tends to present, and we also saw that in the big mass in the spleen previously, that lymphoma rather stereotypically appears as pale, tan, or gray, soft, rather homogeneous tissue. And that can be a clue that lymphoma is the tumor that you're dealing with. Yet another site where horses develop lymphoma is in the skin. So we're looking at, at the flank of a horse uh, to orient you a little bit. Uh, there are two nipples showing here. Remember that tells you it's a mare because uh, male horses don't develop nipples unlike other mammals. 
But uh, so, so there's the inguinal region. We're kind of coming up along the flank here. And the lesion that we're looking at in this picture, it, we don't actually see the lesion, but we see the nodular effect because there is subcutaneous lymphoma in this case. And um, remember that if you're dealing with subcutaneous lymphoma in the horse, that think of what would be their most common form of lymphoma, and that's the T-cell rich large B-cell lymphoma. Okay, switching systems again to the endocrine system. This is a photo from Eleanor Green when she was at the University of Missouri. Uh, the best picture I've ever seen of a horse with hirsutism. That would be the condition, probably a better morphologic diagnosis would be hypertrichosis. And hypertrichosis in the horse is almost pathognomonic for the presence of a pituitary adenoma. So if you were asked to name an associated lesion, pituitary adenoma, and more specifically, pituitary adenoma of the pars intermedia would be your best answer. Here's the tumor. It's actually a different horse, but a fairly characteristic appearance for a macroadenoma. So it's a big tumor in the pituitary gland of a horse. And these will, more than 90% of the time, be in the pars intermedia. They are almost always adenomas. You would not even consider a carcinoma as a, as a probability. And they will be old horses. They're often 20 or, or older than that. So pituitary adenoma, pars intermedia. Now, these lesions are very common in horses, and before they develop the macroadenoma, meaning something that's at least five millimeters in diameter and a lot of times more than a centimeter in diameter, they will develop smaller lesions of hyperplasia. And in, in this sagittal section of a pituitary gland, we, see, we can see a bit of pars nervosa here, and the yellower tissue is the, is the pars anterior. But the, what the picture is to show is two things. One is that the pars intermedia between the, the pars anterior and the pars nervosa is expanded by hyperplasia without the formation of any discrete nodules. So there are no nodules big enough to call a microadenoma, and yet we have diffuse hyperplasia of the pars intermedia. It's encroaching on the pars nervosa. The other lesion that we see, and I don't really know the importance of this, but it's a fairly common lesion, are the presence of these colloid-filled cysts that develop in the pars intermedia. And they're quite striking in this case. This is a, is a sagittal section from a, of the pituitary gland from a different horse. And this time, we do have, again, we have hyperplasia and expansion of the pars intermedia. But we also have the formation of multiple nodules, many of which are more than a millimeter in diameter. None are big enough to call a macroadenoma, but these are what we call microadenomas of the pars intermedia. Again, very common lesions. And if they're extensive and if they're numerous and if they're approaching five millimeters in diameter, I think they can be just as important to the horse as, as a solitary and not very big macroadenoma. So if they're bigger than five millimeters, as in these two pituitary glands, then we call it a macroadenoma or simply an adenoma. And they tend to be gray-white tissue if they're uncomplicated, but as they get very large, they, these are shown at the same scale. When the, when the macroadenomas get quite large, they suffer hemorrhage and necrosis, and so you'll see that color change and texture change there. Okay, leaving the pituitary gland and continuing on through the endocrine system, these are the thyroid gland, or one lobe of the thyroid gland from two different horses, and both of them have thyroid adenomas. And again, you know that this is a, a rather common lesion in older horses, horses that are older than 20. And classically or historically, we thought that many of these were follicular adenomas. Now that we're starting to use immunohistochemistry more and more and looking for calcitonin and, uh, and looking for thyroglobulin, we're finding that many of these and probably most of these are C-cell or medullary thyroid tumors. They are almost invariably benign. So morphologic diagnosis, I think the best one is sort of a generic thyroid adenoma, and then you need the immunohistochemistry to know if it's a medullary C-cell tumor or if it's a thyroid follicular tumor.
Um, this is the larynx and thyroid gland from, from a foal, a uh, fairly neonatal foal, and its thyroid glands are too big, and that's bilateral, but it's a foal, and it's a diffuse enlargement of both lobes of the thyroid, and this is not a tumor. When both lobes of the thyroid gland are enlarged, we can make a morphologic diagnosis of goiter, or we could call it thyroid follicular hyperplasia. Either one would be fine, and the most common cause would be simply iodine deficiency, which was the case in this foal. Iodine deficiency is fairly common in the Pacific Northwest, and this was a foal from Washington State. But we see it elsewhere. Okay, still an endocrine system, but switching to the adrenal gland, these are, the, are both adrenal glands, butterfly preparation, as Julia Child would call it, of a foal that died, neonatal foal that died with herpes virus infection, EHV1. And the lesions that we are seeing is multifocal hemorrhagic necrosis. It's easiest to see in the cortex and um, scattered throughout the cortex as multifocal lesions. So multifocal hemorrhagic necrosis, adrenal gland, or adrenal cortex would be a good morphologic diagnosis. Herpes was the cause, but endotoxemia could produce the same kind of lesion. So that would be a perfectly acceptable alternate cause. And uh, another adrenal lesion, this is a very old horse that is not common at all, but I think it's important to point out that it's not common, is adrenal cortical adenoma. So that's an unusual lesion in the horse, and the reason I stress the fact that it's unusual is that oftentimes the, the disease, the pituitary pars intermedia dysfunction disease or condition that horses develop with their pituitary adenomas is nicknamed, especially by clinicians, equine Cushing's disease. And that's a bad name for the disease, and it's specifically, a, it's a bad name for the disease because it's not like human Cushing's disease, and it's not even like the, the canine Cushing's disease. And the, the, diff, the big difference is that in these horses that have pars intermedia adenomas, they very seldom have hyperplastic lesions or tumors in the adrenal cortex. So this is one horse that did, and it was an adrenal cortical adenoma. So they can get that lesion, but it is not, it's almost never associated with their pituitary pars intermedia dysfunction or pituitary adenomas. Okay, we're switching now to the last system, genital system, and we'll start with female, look at a few examples of female reproductive tract diseases, and then finish up with male reproductive tract. So this picture of the perineum of this mare shows the separative vaginal discharge that clues us into the fact that even though looking at this uterine lining we're mostly seeing hemorrhage that we should make a diagnosis of separative endometritis or, or hemorrhagic and separative endometritis. Slide two is sagittal sections or cross sections of the ovary of ovarian masses from two different mares. I've put in a, a scale here just to clue you in. These ovarian masses in mares are huge. They're volleyball sized. They're somewhat stereotypical in their appearance and this this particular mare's tumor is very characteristic. Think of tumor if it's a mare you're going to think of granulosa cell tumor of course or granulosa fecal cell tumor whichever you want to call it and that's the name of the tumor, that's the morphologic diagnosis. This multilocular cystic nature is very typical, but horses will develop different kinds of granulosa cell tumors, and this one certainly has cysts. I think you should always expect to find them, but this one also has a little bit more solid tissue to it. Another thing that they like to do is form large hemorrhagic cavities, and these hemorrhagic cavities can sometimes expand to the point that all you're left with is a sack of blood. To, uh, to the extent that it can be difficult to find a histologic section with neoplastic tissue in it. Slide three is a smaller ovarian mass from, from a young horse, and uh, it's very difficult, I think, to recognize it as ovary. You can see some oviductal structures here and some perovarian cysts. Uh, it looks more like an ear to me, and you can see that we have a lot of plates of cartilage, 
here. So it's easy to recognize that blue-white opalescent appearance so that you know that that tissue is cartilage. You're also seeing cavities that are filled with a clear mucoid secretion shown here too. And you're seeing cavities that are filled with keratin and hair and probably sebum. And I, I included the higher mag just to convince you that this material included hair. And that's probably the easiest tissue to recognize. And it gives you your diagnosis. So you found ectoderm with the hair. You found endoderm with these mucus-filled cavities. You've got mesoderm with your plates of cartilage. You've got all three germ layers. It gives you a morphologic diagnosis of ovarian teratoma. OK, a case from a mule still in female genital system and looking at the belly of this mule she was in late pregnancy presented with dystocia there's the the almost ready to lactate mammary gland and her abdominal cavity is filled with the uterus and further dissection explained her dystocia this was a case of uterine torsion so we can see the twist at this point as the as the uterine horn disappears into the pelvic canal so uterine torsion in a donkey mare. Um, fetal diseases, this is a particular fetal disease. It's more common in horses than it is in any of our other domestic species. This is umbilical torsion or a twisting of the umbilical cord. Now the horse has a long umbilical cord. It's supposed to have a long umbilical cord because the mare is supposed to be able to stand up and give the give the horse, a, give the, the foal, the newborn foal, a transfusion before the umbilical cord breaks. And it's also normal for, this, for the umbilical cord to spiral in this fashion, but it shouldn't spiral this much. And if it does, does spiral this much, then that's considered torsion, and that strangulates the whole foal, cuts off its blood supply, and the foal will die. So it's, it's an occasional cause of fetal loss in, in horses. And the cause of loss of the mare in, in the reproductive system is this lesion. And you can sometimes diagnose this over the phone, the practitioners that send us these mares, because it is a fatal lesion. Happens in the hours after parturition. And sometimes the practitioners don't even have the opportunity to attend these mares before they're sent to necropsy. And they do make the diagnosis over the phone. And what we find at necropsy is a belly full of blood, hemoperitoneum, and this lesion, which we would morph as, as hematoma in the broad ligament of the uterus, or, or uterine hematoma. And so exsanguination is the cause of death, and the cause of this lesion is rupture of the middle uterine artery, shown right here. And it's an accident of folding that happens very quickly after parturition. Um, still in, in uh, reproductive tract, we're looking at the placenta from an aborted fetus. And we'll notice that this is the cervical area here, the cervical star region here. We'll notice that we do see exudate, telling us that it's placentitis. It looks suppurative or fibrinosuppurative. And we'll notice that the exudate is focused towards or concentrated around the cervical star. So that would suggest an ascending bacterial infection from, from the vagina through the cervix and, and into the placenta. And streptococcus is a, good, is a good culprit in this case. OK, we're leaving. We're still in genital system. We're leaving female and moving into male. And I uh, have a few more slides to show. This was a pony gelding that was castrated sometime previously. The skin wounds were healed. To orient you a little bit, um, uh, hair, obviously. This is the prepuce here, the prepucial orifice here. So we're moving caudally now and this was the site of the castration scar and you can see the lesion that we want to name just uh, deep to that castration scar. The inset shows a higher power of that, of that or higher magnification of that nodular um, lesion. It's in the spermatic cord, it's nodular, think granulomatous or pyogranulomatous because we can see we actually have coalescing nodules and there's purulent exudate in the centers of some of those granulomas. The name of this lesion is scarus cord, and you could 
call it that, but uh, the, the morphologic diagnosis for inflammation of the spermatic cord is funiculitis. That might be a little bit better term. And because of what you're seeing macroscopically, you can call it granulomatous or better pyogranulomatous funiculitis. And this scurrus cord lesion is usually due to contamination at the time of castration. Staph aureus is the typical culprit, the bacterial cause. So slide nine in the male reproductive tract. This time we're looking at an old gelding. And again, looking at the prepucial orifice here. And we have a mass. So we're going to think of tumor, maybe think of granuloma. The mass is ulcerated. We still could be thinking granuloma or tumor. But what I'd like you to appreciate about this mass, to help you distinguish between something like habronemiasis and a squamous cell carcinoma is that this ulcerated mass is right at the mucocutaneous junction and encircles the mucocutaneous junction. And this was a case of squamous cell carcinoma. Just looking at the gross, it, it does somewhat resemble the lesions that we can see in habronemiasis and also like the inguinal area. But this is squamous cell carcinoma. That is a site of predilection for squamous cell carcinoma in horses. Appaloosas are predisposed. And if this were a female animal, then, then its site of predilection for the genital form of squamous cell carcinoma would be the vulva. Again, especially mucocutaneous junction. And the last slide in uh, finishing the genital system and finishing the lecture series is, a, is uh, from photos by Pam Mauser of the testes of an old stallion. And if it were a young stallion, we would think of teratoma because just as we saw in ovarian teratoma, horses are also maybe more prone than other animals to develop teratomas in the testis. But this is an old stallion, so we should think of the common tumor for old stallions, and that's seminoma. So this is an example of testicular seminoma in a stallion. In this first picture, we see a normal testis here, maybe somewhat small actually, and then the massively enlarged testis. And now there's a butterfly preparation of that enlarged testis. And remember that if it, if it were seminoma in a dog or some other species, maybe you've seen more seminomas in, the seminoma tends to be a rather homogeneous, soft, fleshy mass. It often has areas of necrosis and hemorrhage but the tissue is tan or pale gray, it almost looks lymphoma-like, soft and homogeneous, bulging, not much fibrous connective tissue component to it, and none of the yellow discoloration that might th make us think of a latex cell tumor. Plus in the horse, seminoma is overwhelmingly their more common testicular tumor once they get past the teratoma stage. So testicular seminoma in a horse, and that concludes our uh, treatment of reproductive tract diseases and finishes the lectures on gross pathology of diseases of the horse.